I don't know. Uh, Travis, are you seven seven four five? All right. So you are now live on YouTube. Thanks, Pat. Tra Travis, one more time. Sorry, are you seven seven four five? Yes, I am. Okay. Hear me. Thank you. Can you guys, hear me? Yes, sir. So, just for curiosity, do we know how many viewers we had on YouTube yesterday? <clears throat> uh, we didn't have any non-affiliated interest. I guess is how I'd say it. There wasn't any public members attending to watch. All right. Thank you. That's because they're all fishing, Jason. What's that? That's because they're all out fishing. Yeah. Yep. I heard the flows on the Smith are supposed to slow down, though, and I've got some friends that have a permit that might not be able to go. I don't know if that's true or not. You can always wear hiking boots. <laughs> so I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, Go ahead and start. So I, I starting to record the webinar, or I guess our, our meeting now. Um, one thing I failed to do yesterday was have you guys give us kind of a quick update on what's going on in your area, the trap line reports. And so I think this morning we'll take maybe 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and let you guys kind of give an overview. Uh, we have our typical staff here, myself, um, Cami, our admin assistant in the wildlife office. Um, Dustin Ramoy, who you guys met before and again showed his face at the end of the meeting yesterday, our fisheries uh, counterpart. Uh, we've got Quentin who's joining us, looks like. Um, and then we have regional access coordinators represented from regions five, six, or four, five, six, and seven on the call. Um, I know region one and two, the, the lady that handles that, she's uh, going to try and watch the YouTube streams. So. She'll be available as well uh, if we need to tap into her. Um, I'm not sure if we'll get from region three or not. So with that, I think I'll start um, because you're in my first corner, uh, Dale Tribby. Why don't you go ahead and just give us quick, just a quick overview of what's happening in your neck of the woods. You know, I, it, it's just quiet out here. I, we're in that period, you know, between last hunting season and or people really start thinking about it this fall and uh, I spent a little bit of time with some of my landowner friends and well, just hunting issues have not come up. It's so I guess, you know, right now it's quiet here. Good, thank you. Looks like Commissioner Sneakers on the phone. So Ed Beal, you'd be up next on my screen. So, you know, I mentioned yesterday uh, with Director Williams about uh, the fishing industry picking up nationally. Uh, what they estimate is 10 million new people fishing uh, because of the COVID. So I think that's going to be an interesting thing to capture in the future. Um, I do think there's some of it in Montana, um, but mostly what we saw is just a huge surge in and uh, fishing tackle purchases because of the stay at home. And fortunately, we were able to not just stay at home, but to go fishing. So that was pretty remarkable for us. Um, <clears throat> as they came on during the uh, uh, special drawing deadline, we did see quite a few folks that um, weren't very tech savvy that were having a hard time. Uh, getting, becoming able to apply online for their permit. So we saw quite a bit of that. We helped a number of folks do it. Um, but after a while, it got to be too much to, to spend that much time walking people through how to create a MyFWP account and such. 
So that was early on, there was quite a bit of impact with that. Um, everybody's been asking, customers have been asking in regards to licenses and permits, where's my antelope bag? Uh, they've been anticipating that drawing ever since it went paperless uh, happened real quick. And so that turns out pretty much every day. And then also people are inquiring a lot about uh, when am I going to be, be able to buy my over-the-counter bee tag for shoulder hunt. So it's been kind of interesting uh, just watching uh, those questions come up here in our store in those regards. Um, but generally, you know, a lot of folks out enjoying Montana uh, in our region, uh, whether it's fishing or camping. Um, I think the hunting seasons in the spring since we met were pretty calm, the turkey season and all. So that's about what I got for you. Great. Thanks, Ed. Um, Mr. Cornwell, have you joined us? I have. Can you hear me? <laughs> I can. Good to good to hear your hear your voice again. It looks like uh, Cindy joined us as well. Cindy, are you able to hear us? Okay. I am. Um, technical difficulties. <laughs> no, no worries. Thank you. So it looks, looks like we've got almost everybody here. Um, I'm not sure if, if Dan's going to join us this morning or if, uh, or Senator Ankeny either, um, but those folks are, are not here. Um, Commissioner Stuker, you'd be next on my screen. You're, you're up, please. Oh, excuse me. Uh, in our area, the biggest thing that was happening here about two, three weeks ago, uh, male grizzly bear got as far as Big Sandy and north. So they're moving this way fairly rapidly. Uh, FWP kept track of the bear for quite a while and he moved from Loma to Big Sandy and north and and uh, don't know what happened to him. I haven't heard anything lately now on, on where he went or if they hadn't captured him last I knew uh, he did get into a chicken coop and kill some chickens and he was eating cat and dog food off people's porches. So they're going to have to start, uh, watching that a little more in our area. I had said last year that in five years, they would be over to my place. And I don't think it's going to take five years and they're going to be here with how they're moving. Uh, a lot of people, as, as Ed said, are out fishing from this area. Uh, going over to Fresno and uh, south of Sh Sh uh, Haver into the Beaver Creek Park. Uh, so they're keeping pretty busy that way. And, and, you know, and that's the main thing that's uh, happening around here. Of course, on the commission, the Madison is a big issue. And that's just getting worse with uh, the amount of anglers we have out due to the COVID-19. Uh, so those are really the, the big areas that, uh, that I'm getting a lot of phone calls on. Thank you, Commissioner Stuker. Uh, Ed Bukowski, you're next on my screen. Well, around here, uh, the far west fishing access, we had a black bear up there, tipped over a beehive. And I think the fishing game relocated. I'm not positive. I think they did. And then also up our Mel's Creek, out my coal strip, there was a black bear up there. I know the bee guy pretty well. And so he had to electrify the fence. So they're out on the prairie, a little bit moving around. As I mentioned before, we got grasshoppers, the zoo here. And like I said, it's, uh, they're not going to be much range grass left this fall. Um, <clears throat> seen quite a few young pheasants, uh, little buggers stay off the road, but, uh, also on our place, we have a sandhill crane nest and I haven't tried to peek in. I don't know how friendly those people are, but uh, I know where they're at. So but, uh, other than that, like I said, it's pretty quiet around here and river's going down. So people will be fishing on the Yellowstone. That's all I have. 
Great, thanks, Ed. Uh, Representative Logie. Yeah, around here we've got this year. A lot of people are saying they see more bears this year than they have in past years, and I. But ours are just black so far. Um, there probably are a, a few of, of the friendly grizzlies trying to work their way in, but nobody's talking about spotting them. Um, we've got a lot of timber management activities, especially in the Superior Ranger District. We've got probably the highest numbers of uh, timber sales going on in, of anywhere in the state. And, you know, with our lower numbers of elk that we've had in recent years, um, part of that has been due to habitat. And so we're going to see a lot better elk habitat come back uh, with, with all of the timber sales we have going on. Um, the huckleberries are starting to get ripe and we've got talking about fishermen, uh, the Forest Service talks that they're giving away or selling more maps this year. People are, all the tourists are coming in and we've got a great number of, of high mountain lakes and the tourists are flocking to those lakes and, and our river, Clark Court River is full of fishermen all the time. But the other issue, and I'm, of course, I was the broken record on that and that's the wolves still uh, are, seem to be dominating more than the elk and the deer. And, and that's what's partly pushing the elk down to the hay fields. Uh, but region one and the western part of region two still still are hoping for some different elk, uh, wolf management in their area. Uh, and I know Commissioner Stucker knows that. So uh, that's basically everything for my area. Great, thank you, Representative Logie. Uh, Cindy. What's going on in your neck of the woods? Um, um, we'd like to thank the FWP and everyone who helped us get more land over there um, on Mount Hagen on the backside. Um, that that is great, and uh, they removed some of the fencing, etc. There, and they have another um, area they're removing fencing from this Friday. Um, so that'll be good. The sportsmen's groups are helping do that. Uh, still involved in the Madison and concerned about that and the crazies. That's it. Thanks, Cindy. Mr. Cornwell, how are things up Northeast Montana? Well, we've been blessed. We've had we had an abundant amount of moisture last fall. It was slow getting everything done. Most everybody's going to have a crop, and uh, there was enough moisture last fall. There doesn't appear to be a lot of grasshoppers yet. I'm sure that one of these days they'll revisit us like they did in the 80s. The biggest thing that happened along, along up here is our, our St. Mary's water. Uh, the, 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 there's a 30, 40 mile an hour mile ditch that brings water from Sherburn Dam and Glacier Park over into the Milk River, which feeds into Fresno. And we started the irrigation season. It's about it supplies about half the water for the irrigation project here. And uh, they one of the big drops failed. There's five drops that drop it down into the North Fork of the Milk River, and it goes in. Then it goes up into Canada and goes around the Sweetgrass Hills and comes into Fresno. But we um, we were lucky. There was a, a Montana Construction Company. Slatton by name that was building a school in in Browning, and the irrigation districts got got together. Our manager got a hold of them, and and Schweitzer, the Schweitzer administration had set aside ten million dollars to to start to fix it. The way it works with the beer reclamation, it's their their project, and they every time they do a contract, we do a contract with them. The irrigators pay for it, but the beer reclamation takes forty percent oversight off the top of it, and so. Anytime we do something with a contract, the Bureau of Rec takes 40% of it. And in this one, they decided they'd do for five. They've been milking us like a milk cow for 100 years. <laughs> they estimated it was going to cost two, $250 million to fix our project. And we think we're going to be able to get all the drops in serviceable condition this summer. This is the first time it hasn't had water in it since 1916. And we were hoping that we'll have the 
we'll have the water system back up and operating because the Milk River up where I'm at, that's our main river. The, the Missouri, we never have any problem with it with Fort Peck Dam or anything. The Governor's Cup was just over. I think the winning team caught 70 pounds of fish in two days. So that seems to be working good. But we, we're hoping that we'll have we'll have the have the irrigation project fixed this year. We had 100 and had both reservoirs were full of water when the when the system failed. So everybody's going to get one shot of water anyway. So we'll we'll be okay. The white tailor's starting to come back, and, and I think we're going to have a pretty good pretty good hatch on the pheasants and the sharp-tailed grouse and things. So I think everything's everything looks pretty good here. No bears. And the wolves are pretty obvious here, and I don't know what happens to them if one of them shows up, you never hear any more about it. So it's good. That's all I got. Thanks, Lee. Any questions or discussion amongst members there? No? Okay. Well, thank you guys for for uh, giving that update. It's it's helpful for all of us to know what's going on. And like I said, I apologize. I missed it yesterday, but I figured too, by the time we sat here for three and a half hours, folks were kind of burned out. All right. Um, so as we roll into the next, basically the rest of today or the rest of the meeting, um, I wanted to, to give a big shout out uh, to our agency staff, um, it, as you guys know, we did a big uh, communications campaign back in, in early May. Um, that was, again, a lift by our ComEd folks. Our um, legal staff helped, obviously, right arm and review projects as we had questions on them. Um, the hunting access coordinators, uh, again, we've got regions four, five, six, and seven represented today. They took on a, a new workload, um, particularly in the eastern part of the state where we had a lot of landowners who may have had some interest, but then weren't sure exactly what they were looking at or how to get a map developed or what the program meant. And so we put a lot of time and effort and they put a lot of effort in uh, to producing what you guys have before you today. So shout out to all of our FWP staff. Um, again, the fisheries as well. There's a fishing component to this that I think kind of surprised um, some of us as we gr were going through it. And then, um, you know, we had had Dustin review a few projects uh, to, to kind of provide his recommendation. Um, when I sent out the, the sheet last week um, to you guys about the process we're going through, what I wanted to do is kind of give that as an overview. So again, we're dealing with this new public access land agreement program, um, kind of fell into to my lap because it involves you all. And so here we are, uh, your responsibility therein is to look at the projects and make a recommendation to the department on what we should do with those projects. The process so far in large part has been, we got an application, uh, hopefully it was complete. We have some that are incomplete. So they're missing either their $5 application fee, they're missing maps or they're missing their grazing or lease documentation to prove one that they're a leaseholder or two that they um, you know, sh should be the one applying for these applications. We've, we've done a lot of research on cadastral and land ownership, trying to understand who's got what and where it's at and who's, who's got a right of way easement that's for themselves and their, their family, but doesn't extend to the public. And so there's been a lot of work on that background side. So that's kind of the process is that we're taking the applications if they're complete, um, we're going through them on a regional level to review the regions work a lot with myself and um, Dustin to use the, the, the scoring criteria and the dollar assessments that we discussed and set kind of previously at our, our other meeting. We kind of thrown out some numbers to say here's here's what we think it's worth and then go from there with a you know kind of starting base payment of $1,500 moving from there. Um, used a lot of regional staff to, to try and develop and refine that scoring criteria a little better. So then once we got the applications, we had regional staff work to review it. Um, we, they, they come up with basically a dollar valuation, um, presented that to, to me and or to Dustin Ramoy. Then we would go back to the landowner um, and say, well, is this, is this anywhere close to your, where you're thinking? Um, is, this, is this gonna be worthwhile to you to, to, make, to make this public access agreement work. Uh, some of them said, yep, 
and that's what you see before you is on the eligible list basically those that said this is this is what i'm thinking anyway or this is where we're at um and maybe the regional coordinators can shine a little bit more light on those discussions but there's also some that um you know said nope i wouldn't do it for that um to which we you know we kind of dug into a little bit but those ones we can also discuss uh, before you as well there's one uh project in that uh, that we'll get to that is is what I'd say uncertain. So there's one that's a, a possibly a public road, but it's not being um, declared by the county as an open road or public road. So there's more work to do on it. And and per uh, the arm language, uh, we we are to bring that to you as well for a recommendation. So. It's it's your guys's your guys's call on how you would like to handle that. Um, like I said, we have regional expertise joined us from um, four, five, six, and seven. Looks like uh, so as we get into those projects or just the program as a whole, how it's working, how it's not working. Um, those those folks can provide that perspective also. So, any questions on kind of what the rest of our meeting is going to look like? Did yeah, this is Lee. Did you send? Did you email me all that stuff? I'm I misplaced it or never got it. I'll have to go back up and get my technological lady to to uh, print it off for me. So if we have something that we need to look at, yeah, I, I'll um I'll I'll display it on my screen, but that doesn't help you, Lee, since you're on a phone. Uh, we did right. try and try and overnight some packets to to the members at least. Again, I don't oh, know. Okay, but it wasn't wasn't sent electronically, so I'll just bumble along here, and, and okay, it'll be fine. So thanks. Okay. Yep. Any other comments? Yeah, Jason, I wanted to ask: Was it only the one that really had a road problem? A question. The others sorted themselves out. Yeah, I believe so. Yep. You know, maybe <clears throat> before we get to it, we might just have that discussion. I. You know, I can see the potential of, of somebody saying their road is not a public road and, and just try to try and take advantage of this. And I think on, unless we see that it actually is or is not, I don't I, I don't know that we should act on something that's in a gray area. Yeah, I would, I, I would concur. Yeah, I would agree with that. You know, I, my understanding we should not be proceeding with anything, any one of these proposals that isn't 100% clear that it's it's okay to do in regards to that ask access question, and that's it. Um, I think that's the biggest one of the biggest quagmires we can get into is if we make one of these decisions and we find out next year that uh, in fact there is public access, and now we created a problem. Was that oh, Bill Dobbins? I think we just need to be 100% sure that each of these that we're going to uh, recommend to the department to go ahead with, that we're 100% certain that this is the right access opportunity and access isn't in question. Yep. Uh, well, that's Jason, I agree, but isn't that the one that they're going to do some more research on um, after the county attorney returns? Yeah, so so the, the county attorney um, has gotten has gotten back to us on that one and they're they're saying it's gray. They're saying it's it's that it's not been petitioned to be a public road. So it's technically maybe not a public road, but there's there's the question of prescriptive or historic easements that nobody's looked in on that road. And so um, their, their recommendation to us was, well, we're not gonna make a decision. You guys, if you wanna do more digging on it, you can dig on it. So that's where that one sits. Um, and I can, my screen, so you guys can at least see, I think we're, uh, we're looking perhaps. It's, it's the uh, it's this uh, let me go down here um, so it'd be the second one kind of in your pack it's it's that um, so this is the first one we'll, we'll talk about that so it's the split diamond uh, BMA um, 
it's open in block management currently or has been historically open through block management. Um, it, it, like I said, I think it should be the second one. Uh, it's, it's not on the table because of the uncertainty. Then I look back at the arm again this morning and say, well, maybe I need to present it to PLW. So it is actually there in the, the pages. It's number two, essentially in your, your booklet. Um, but realistically what you're looking at is, is again, here's, I don't know, hopefully you can see my screen. There's, it should be a map. Um, it's like a onyx map with, uh, the BMA, split diamond ranch BMA. It does go from, from, so White Hall is over here. Um, so this road, this is where we're talking about getting into section 12, section one, that kind of stuff about, well, from this point on, it could be private, it could be public. We're not exactly sure hundred percent, um, but there is a declared open road through the DNRC piece. So that's what that kind of purple is. So that road is declared open by DNRC, which then connects you to the BLM surrounding it, plus a big chunk of, of forest land. And so that's, that's, uh, that'd be that second, second one. So in your packets, it's actually got even a, a fuel tax map. Um, so it's not the first one, but it's, it's, it's the second one there, the split diamond. It's got a, like I said, it's come out with that, that point. Um, you saw the note from, from our game warden, Bill Dawson there. It kind of shows again, some different points where the landowner at section 12 and section one is looking for a cattle guard. Um, but it's, it's not part of the, the fuel tax road system. So there's kind of, like I said, probably some gray area. And so it sounds like from others folks perspective, um, you'd like to just wait to see how that one plays out. Jason, I agree. Um, the, the, um, submissions that weren't complete or had, or had issues, they're actually, they start again near the end of the book, at least they do in mine. Yep. Yep. They should all be there. The ones that were ineligible to, um, this one, like I said, I, I didn't put it in the summary table, but then I realized it's page two or three in your, your books past that first table. But, um, so I think, I think if I, if that's, I don't know if we you know, need to do official motions and all that kind of stuff, because that's not how you guys have typically operated, but it sounds like a more of a consensus that with that one, just due to the gray area, um, We'll just we'll just hold on to that one for now. How many how many applications did we get statewide? Uh, about forty five different applications, of which twenty seven are before PLPW. -E. Thanks. So, Jason, a couple of questions I have. Um, last evening we received. Um, files email from the Montana file service with, you know, that have all those documents in them is, was that a repeat of what was sent, you know, last Friday or whatever, or is there new information in there that we needed to look into? That's, that's one question I have. No, I'm guessing that's just a reminder. So what okay. happens if you, even if you download it or don't download it from that file transfer, it'll keep sending you an email every five or 10 days. It says it's about to expire. So it's the same information, okay. there's nothing new. Okay, and then secondly, um, and I don't know, I can't speak for the, the other council members, but for myself, when we look at the um, agreement assessment forms and on the first page, it has seven numerical or seven items and then with a numerical rating, basically from one to five for most of them. And uh, I'm just wondering, was there guidance given to the different regions in terms of how points were going to be assigned to those things? Because it's just reviewing these, it seemed to me there was inconsistency and certainly that it's, it's preference by, by the regions and how they look at them, but I'm just wondering if there was some type of matrix, you know, provided or agreed to that, okay, this is worth a four, this is worth a one. I mean, some of them are pretty obvious when you start looking at acres, uh, public land open, that, that one's not a tough one, but some of the other ones, um, it's like, okay, how, what warranted a four or a five here on this one and a two someplace else? 
Sure. So we we do have some guidance for some of the questions. So like, for example, the first question is, if you provide year round access for all hunting and fishing seasons, it's worth five points. Um, question two, similarly, if it's just hunting or fishing, it's worth three. You add one if you're going to add other recreational opportunities, such as camping, birding. Uh, when you get into some of the other stuff, we end up uh, noticing that same problem, Dale, when, when we started to get the regional submissions back in. And so the access coordinators and myself and Dustin, I think, uh, all got together and kind of reviewed each other's applications and said, okay, why did you score it this way? Why did you, why did you rank it a two versus a three? What does that have implications for a total score? Um, and so the regions and myself sat down and kind of looked at each other's to present um, at least region four, five, six, and seven they're similar, I guess is how I would say that in their scoring, because we, we, we worked on each other to make each other basically defend your score or even, you know, looking at it. Why did, if there's no conflicts, why did you score it a three, uh, for example, on the second page, um, that kind of stuff. We, we worked through it and made sure that folks were at least looking at things similarly uh, prior to it going to a landowner discussion. Okay. I don't know if any of the coordinators want to comment on that or. I was wondering the same thing, but yeah, that was a good, good approach. Cause yeah, sometimes you just like personal evaluations, you're a great guy and the next guy doesn't think he is. So. Yep. Like I said, I know we had, uh, like I said, four five, six and seven, uh, had the opportunity to do each other's applications and, and go from there. Okay. Thank you. So um, with that, I think we'll start on just the, the ones that went through from a eligible standpoint. Um, I think you, I hope you can see my screen anyway. It should be the first, first one here is the, the XC Ranch. Um, should be a simple one to look at, I guess, from a, what it's providing and, and what's available. Um, the region came up with a total score of 17 out of 55 for this one section, which then would result uh, because the landowner is allowing hunting just from the just for the fall. Uh, no other add ons. Uh, it's not motorized access. And then so then you look at the, the points piece of it for a total of, of 1250 is what the, the region is is proposing for this one section for walk access across the purple stuff, which is which is a BMA. Any thoughts on that one? So correct me on this. Uh, they're walking across BMA now. Right. So that that section was or was or is open through block management, but now it will be redrawn the boundary will be drawn from the block management program to show that the bma is just the purple or just the private land there in sections 25 26 35 and uh, section 36 will be enrolled in in pala should you all and the director agree so so a couple comments in that area i mean most of that land is very open right in there. Um, I guess to me, since you can't drive further into that hunting area, I kind of question the real value of adding that other than if it, and it wasn't marked here as a real high satisfaction for the landowner. But in that case, the carry properties used to be in more block management across the highway. Um, and I don't know if this would enhance their view of FWP and all that. Um, what did the, the warden or the regional people think on this particular ask on the Pala? Uh, we don't don't have any representation from region three today it looks like um but 
I guess that that's maybe why they scored it a little bit lower is because it was already accessible through BMA. Um, but in regards to, you know, if it's, yeah, that's, I guess that's what I know is that it was scored probably a little bit lower because it's accessible through BMA. There's no motorized access. There's no other um, camping or hiking or anything else to add on to it. Um, the the thousand dollars basically would be just for the the hunting seasons to open that one state section. So what could happen is the landowner could say, I'm no longer allowing access across my block management area to that state parcel. Um, there's there's been documented department position that that's okay from our 2013 audit. So that's that's the alternative. And that's where we find ourselves with a lot of these block management landowners as well. If you don't offer it, they could shut down access completely. If you do offer it, they may keep it open and you don't gain much. Um, but that's, again, that's that's part of the program is that it's, it's open for block management landowners to apply. Um, they're eligible to receive a payment as well as improvements for, for allowing access to inaccessible public land or under accessible public land. And that one would be meeting that program def definition by statute and by arm. Um, but basically the, the minimum that we could pay anybody through this program is about 1,250 bucks. Um, and that's what you see before you on this project. Now, oh, is that multi hill road? Does that get you into the block management, or no? Is that an access into the block management? I'm going to say that's not uh, access road because it's not. So what you're looking at now on my screen, at least, is the. Yeah. I think the block for XC Ranch. And so the access roads defined on the map are the black and, and roads. And so um, I think you're getting to the ranch headquarters, perhaps, and you're getting on Dunn Canyon on the south end, uh, but you're not touching the BMA. My thoughts are, is if they're already in block management, I think you can ignore the access at 36. Yeah, and what I know about that area, Jason, the, the only reason I see to include this one is goodwill uh, for potential benefits of other carry properties. Because um, really that whole, the whole hunting opportunity in that block management area from the ranch headquarters and the sign-in box is to walk the two and a half miles uh, into section 34 or come from the top of Dunn Canyon to get to section 33. That is one one area I know a little bit about. But anyway, that's my two cents is it looks to me like that particular unit, it'd be a goodwill move if that regional staff believes it is. I think you're right, Ed. So again, recognize before you, you'll have quite a few block management landowners. Um, very similar situation, right? Where it was, it was accessible through the BMA. The landowner now can say it's no longer accessible. Through. As a result, I want you to pay me for a pallet if you want access to that state piece. I don't know the landowner. I don't know that that's what's going to happen. Um, at the same time, they, you know, they kind of have you in an interesting spot with them saying, well, I, I'll just yank my entire block management area or, or whatnot, and you can do just to the pallet. There's there's all those all those dynamics at play from a landowner choice of what they would like to do. And so um, I guess I'd look to your guys' official kind of recommendation on this one. The, the thing to also note, maybe it doesn't make a difference in how we discuss these, is that if we add up all the approved projects and the dollar figures for improvements as well as payments, we're about 205,000, 210,000, something like that, um, out of our a million that was appropriated this biennium. So it's not like it's a, a money issue, uh, is how I would say it, but it, it may be um, not something you're comfortable with. So I guess I'd like to you all for your recommendation, and then we'll go from there. So this is maybe well, more precedent. Go ahead. 
Go ahead. This Denley. is one of those we should maybe. I mean, we we need to look at the process that we've gone through, and maybe this questions that we've made a few errors. But if you look at question number three on that first page, um, the one rating there, so you didn't get a lot of points there, and so we have taken that into account slightly that it already is accessible. So this is one of those we might learn from. Yeah, and I, I just question when we're looking at these applications like this. So the requirement is that they're legally inaccessible or under accessible. And I don't see where this enhances. It's already legally accessible. So then you question I mean, here it says it's legally inaccessible except for block management. So yeah, does that actually qualify for the PALA, the way the arm is? Yeah. Okay. Yep, it'd be, it'd be under accessible. So, yeah, you can take Dunn Canyon, Dun Canyon Road to the forest in Section 32, but there's no, there's no legal access to that section unless you're flying into it. Up to the block management that already exists. Correct. But if, yeah, if you pulled the block management area, you wouldn't have access to the state section. Yeah. Hmm. Whatever we decide on this one will impact all the others because there's a whole slew of these that, yep. that have accessibility through the BMA now, but won't. Yeah, to me, I. I was, and I really, I realize hope doesn't do you anything, but I was hoping that these would enhance access to these points, not just continue already agreed upon access. But in this case, it doesn't really enhance it. It just continues it with an additional payment. Is that correct? That's correct. I, I have one question we, we do, here. Go ahead, Carl. I mean, maybe I'm looking at this wrong, but I'm getting a little heartburn. I think this guy's double dipping. Is anybody else looking that direction or um, actually triple dipping? He's getting benefit from a state lease, and then we're paying him money for BMA, and we're paying him money to walk through the BMA into the state lease that he's using. No, no. It's my understanding, though, that if these lands are enrolled in the PAVA program, they would be pulled out, that state section would be pulled out of block management. Is that a correct statement or not, Jason? Yeah, the boundary would be redrawn. Okay. And clearly, the intent was to allow them to have both opportunities. You know, that's correct. I think, I think that's correct. the question on this particular piece of state land. I don't believe it's an enhanced hunting opportunity. I mean, unless there happen to be antelope maybe there, I don't know. I mean, this is an elk hunting opportunity up uh, on section 32, 33 at the head of Dunn Canyon. And that is all sagebrush open down in 36. So whatever, it's a messy one and it's simple. I, I was I hoping it would be a that. simple one. <laughs> Go ahead, Cindy. I, I'm sorry. I think I'm with Ed. I'm not sure about the enhanced hunting. A goodwill if we want to do it, but it does open up a can of worms for the rest of these and for uh, the future. But it is a new program. You know, if we exactly. take that approach, though, we're going to lose. I mean, if, if we apply that same standard to all of these, my guess is that the majority of them are going to fall off. Because it looked to me like a good deal of these were associated with block management areas that are already accessible via the block management program. But as Jason mentioned before, it was my understanding that somebody's participation in block management did not preclude them from, from uh, enrolling in the PALA program. That, that's, that's correct, Dale. There was the, 
the very first original legislation that came through had a had language where if you received a block management payment, you could not enroll in this program. Uh, through a, a few amendments, that language was taken out because they saw uh, the legislature saw a need to provide perhaps additional incentive to those who are also enrolled in block management. So, so that's correct. You you could receive both payments. Um, even though you may not be opening new access. Well, I would suggest here, here, can I, we can you know, go it, on. It just appears to me that if we score them with the criteria that were set forth in the in the deal and then let the chips fall where they may, and and then we do we set the scoring criteria or is that written in ARM? No, it was it was the stuff that we came up with at the, the March meeting. So if we, it looks to me like there's an opportunity here for us to kill this thing before it ever gets going, if we're, if we're not careful. And if, do we have the ability to adjust as we find out how it works? This one, what did you say it was $1,000? I apologize that I don't have the stuff to look at. But the, yep. um, if there's got to be some other ones. And I know at one time the whole Bear Paw Mountains south of Haver were in block management. And for one reason or another, it's all out now. And we could, it's the innuendo or the supposition is worse than the actuality sometimes. You might not think that it's worth $1,000 to pay for access to, a, to something, but what are we giving up besides that? Because people will react. Well, that's my two cents worth. <laughs> I understand, Lee, and I guess when I look at this particular piece, and this is the last I'll say about it. That section for hunters is of little value. So the value is to the landowner to gain some right. payment, and that's it. Um, and again, I'm not saying, it's kind of like the definition of who gets to apply for uh, preference on landowner preference. You know, right, right there, uh, section 36, or, yeah, and it probably runs through there. So, so this decision would be uh, aimed towards the satisfaction of the landowner, which is certainly viable, um, but doesn't gain access to the for the hunter out of what already exists. So, I'm sure we're going to go through all, that situation on almost every eastern request for this program. Yep. Or you know it a little bit, Ed. I don't know, you know, if they only take one antelope off there or something like that. If it's out there in the, in the nothing land, you know, we have a section up here by us where a guy was in block management up by Ingemar for antelope hunting. And I haven't seen an antelope in there in three years. And, you know, 20 people sign up. Well, <laughs> I guess it's just goodwill payment for some place to walk around. But uh, I'm a little doubtful to put it in. But if we lose block management, then you're in a catch-22. Yeah, and I was wrong. This is my last statement. I think, uh, I think for the goodwill, when I look at what's around it and possibility, even though it could set a precedent in other decisions, I think it probably should be done because of the value or the cost, but the potential goodwill across the highway might be worth it. So on this one, what's the length of the agreement? Is it one year, three years? I see on one later, a individual wants a 10 year agreement. I believe this is annual. So I, I'm gonna agree with Ed there at the end. If this is an annual one, I think maybe we should go ahead and do it because uh, my concern and is the loss of the other block management goodwill, but yet it is going to set a precedent as we move forward. And I believe at our last meeting, that was a comment that I made, you know, how are we going to deal with the block management areas that uh, people have? And we're seeing that come up now. And I know we're gonna get into it a little later, but when I look at some of these payments, for a couple thousand acres on what they're going to get. And then I look at the cap of $15,000 or 
for some of these landowners that have 50,000 acres that are in block management, uh, that's going to create a problem. And we're going to see a lot more of these in future. And I think you remember, I brought up the example of myself and a couple other guys. Uh, we're all in block management, but if we pulled out, we could probably make two to three much times as much as we do under the block management because we control uh, two or three townships up there by the three, three of us for the access. Okay, so I wrote in I wrote in for your recommendation to go ahead and do it for the goodwill to the landowner concerns over other access provided meaning positive or negative. Um, is that a fair statement. Anyone adamantly opposed. Not trying to kill discussion because this these same these same issues will definitely show themselves as we move forward. Um, but those are the two that we have uh, from Region Three, and they're so that we'll have access coordinators to talk about perhaps the other ones as well uh, coming coming up on the next ones. Okay. Well, I I think we the criteria we set up and this fell under that criteria, so we we pretty much have to use it this time around, and maybe we'll need to try and figure out how to deal with it next time. Okay. So that's that's what yes, I'll have I'm, for. I'm uh, with Dinley on that one. Let's just call this in a goodwill one and see how it flies for a year. Okay. Like, I, like we talked about yesterday, we'll probably have to revisit some of our scoring criteria and stuff as we move forward, even the next meeting to revisit what it looks like going into the 2021 year. Um, but just recognizing, like we said already, the the, stat, the legislature did authorize for, for both to be enrolled in block management and receive that payment, as well as be enrolled in this program and receive that payment. So uh, moving on then, um, this is that, I, I hope you can see it. It says split diamond. That's the one where we just talked about the road issue first. So I think that one, again, with that one, I just put in as a recommendation, not proceeding due to gray area, not sure if it's public or not public. Um, so that one just on hold, I guess is how I'd say it for now. Any issues with that one? I think that's a wise choice. We don't want to, that's a fight we don't want to get in. Okay. Moving on to region four. Let me skip down here to the bottom. Um, so AJ Curry Ranch, um, again, regional scores, uh, 4,200 acres, 300 acres of public land. Um, the, the region provided a good Kind of a good uh, overview of what's what's there. Um, large parcels, season long opportunity for elk, mule deer, antelope, sharp tails. Um, again, this was previously enrolled and accessible through block management. Um, landowners willing to provide uh, motorized game retrieval. So I'll scroll down here to a total anyway of uh, 5750 is what the region is recommending or has come up with using our scoring criteria. And then the, the map. So the, what you see here in the, the blue, the blue dash lines, I guess, would be um, the landowner's BLM lease, uh, recognizing that all the other public land then is also made accessible. So whether it be section 31 or 30 or 29, um, any discussion on, on this one? I like this one. You know, I, I do have one question reg regarding the game retrieval. Maybe Derek can answer this. Uh, I mean, I read where the landowner will allow game retrieval. My question is, you have the parking area and then the walking trails from the parking area to the edges of the BLM. 
Is the game retrieval simply driving from there to the edge of the BLM, or is there access into the tracks of BLM? Because it, it's a, it could be a long way from from the edges of those public lands to into into the center of them or to the far edges of them for game retrieval. Hi, Dale. This is Derek. Um, the western parcel has a pretty extensive road network that allow motorized retrieval into the depth of it. The eastern parcel does not quite have um, um, as much road infrastructure. So that one, the eastern parcel, the under accessible parcel will be a little bit more difficult to have motorized game retrieval. Um, however, that might include ATVs and UTVs, which could travel off road for motorized game retrieval with the, the landowner's permission. Yeah, other than that's not authorized on BLM. So if there's not a trail, I understand that. But oh, uh, correct. If there, Sorry. If there is a trail that goes into it, uh, again, I, I was just unclear reading the write up on it. And, and uh, uh, you know, it says, well, you know, again, if great game retrieval is allowed, but you're only allowed to drive in a quarter mile to the edges of the BLM, that's one thing. But in a, what I'm hearing you say, at least on the western portion, there's a trail network. Yes they're not so sure about the eastern parcel. So that answers my question. We need to clarify those access details or no? So that's one of my notes that I've made uh, or maybe our fall meeting or a future meeting. That's one of the things that uh, I believe we need to have more information on on the next iteration of, of these submittals. There's a little more information when it talk what, in terms of game retrieval and, and some other things, uh, you know, that need to be more clearly defined. But I don't know that we need it today. So is this is this one? Are you are you comfortable moving forward with with the uh, recommendation to the department to do this one? I am. I yes. am. I okay. like it. Yep. Yep. And as far as Dale's comment, you know, you're you were in BLM, but I I I'm on a committee down there too, and then people have this lease for cattle, like so there's going to be trails out there. They check cattle. Well, and, and that's, that's a true statement. However, depending on, uh, you know, where those trails take off from, uh, you know, like in this situation, it's, it appears on that Western parcel, there's a trail that takes from the, the walking trail or from the edge of the BLM, it goes into it. It's not as clear on the Eastern part. And uh, yeah, there are trails on them, but uh, um, and nobody's suggesting this, and I understand that, but the idea that, yeah, you can go in and, and retrieve game. If there's not an established vehicle trail in there, um, regardless of what the, the intent of the landowner is, is that there needs to be a, a vehicular trail to allow game retrieval. You cannot drive off of a trail to go retrieve game on any public land or any BLM lands in Montana. Or state. Same thing. Uh, right, right. Yeah, I agree with that. Okay. So for this one, I, I put go forward with this project, define uh, motorized access. So just just so everybody's aware, and that, that note I made kind of for myself for the next meeting, but also um, all of these projects, should they be approved, will have their own individual property map and rules, just like we do for block management. And they'll all be available on our website. So um, what you're looking at through this, this process is kind of a hodgepodge of either department made maps, uh, landowner submitted maps, um, or, or something else, I guess that, you know, it, it, it's not, this isn't the finished polished uh, public facing product, I guess is how I would define uh, a lot of the maps that you're looking at. Okay. Okay. Throw one more thing in there. This is a BMA cooperator already. I would, hope, 
I would hope as we implement this part of it, that access to the public lands, that nothing's set in concrete yet about how we set those maps. So as we get towards the season, that those are all lined out clearly for, for the hunter. So we don't create any extra problems that don't already exist by, by approving this, but not filling in the blanks of the details. Okay. As Dale was pointing out, where can I go? You know, if I look at this and I could just get in part way to any of those Eastern or Western, uh, section areas, it would be worth it for that access for recovery. If I know I can use those main open BLM trails, but I would hope that we would have those clearly lined out, uh, as the seasons begin. So there are, is no question, therefore not creating any crack in our relationship there between that landowner and uh, hunters accessing it a little differently. Uh, in region seven, I know right now that they were doing some road trail access verification maps. And so I, I don't know where all that is. That was in region seven, but I don't know about up here. Yeah, I know, I know, uh, Ed, as you well know, too, if you're using some uh, commercially available private products, you won't see all the intricacies as much as you would even using a department map. But um, that happens, that happens today with block management, but you're right, trying to make sure that the public knows what's available. All right, um, I said not to try and cut conversation short, but I just want to make sure we keep moving through so we have time to talk about these and then any um, program legislative changes we want to maybe explore um, so we can get those on the docket as well prior to another even even prior to another meeting um, the american prairie reserve submitted an application for their pn ranch um, high quality habitat and, and game opportunity uh, the region originally had a blm chunk in there for uh, 30, a total of 31, 35 public land acres. After talking with Derek um, last Friday, I think it was, or, or getting an email from, I guess the, the APR isn't, or doesn't have the lease on the BLM. So they were only able to enroll their state, um, their state lease. And so um, the, the score is reflective of, of that even revised Revised number, uh, the region's comfortable with where it's at. Again, no conflicts because they've been allowing access previously. Um, just the side note here, the, the PN Ranch was restricted to family employees, but now they're looking at uh, trying to promote public access to public lands as well as their private lands. I think there's a potential work in, in place for their block, a block management agreement as well. Um, so following again, following our scoring criteria, what, what did, what we did do is for this one, um, the, the APR is going to shut down motorized travel for six months of year and is open for six months. So we, we cut that in half and which, which would result in a, in a lesser payment. Um, and then, so I guess the region has a total of 7750, um, and this is, this is the property or this is the map um, that would be providing access to uh, perhaps the, the bigger chunk there kind of in the middle of your screen says uh, HD 426, but then also um, some motorized travel uh, all the way up through a couple different chunks of, of state land as well. Thoughts or comments? Well, when you say they're going to restrict access to six months a year, does that, is it going to be open during the majority of the general hunting seasons? Yes. So the, the, the restriction on access was just for motorized travel. They're open, they're open year round for public access, but then uh, they're, they're closed for motorized travel at, for that access route for part of the year. But what part of the year are they closed to motorized access? So, Dale, this is Derek. Um, 
the motorized access will close down with the start of the general rifle season each year and then go through, uh, I think it's mid-April. And the concern there, I believe, is really just the condition of the road. Um, later on in the fall, we get snow. Um, it's, a, it's a gumbo gravel road for the majority of it. Um, so yeah, I think they, they just don't wanna see excessive damage to their infrastructure there. However, during that closure period, they are allowing, of course, walking, but also bicycles or horseback access on that, that access road. Okay, thanks, Derek. You bet. So, as I look at this map, they have two parking areas. So, and I correct that they can go to the parking areas or they cannot go to the parking areas once the trails are are shut down. The other thing is, can they, are, are they limited? If they can go to the parking areas, is that the only place that they're limited to? Because it's a long way from those parking areas back to some of the other parts of that state land. So the parking areas specifically are for um, motorized vehicles. So when it's open for motorized vehicles for that six months out of the year, that's where they do expect them to park. Somebody on foot or bicycle or horseback can access those parcels um, anywhere from the access trail. So essentially no motorized at any point once the season starts. Once the rifle season starts, all of archery season and then you know, part of uh, rifle antelope is open for motorized travel. I know previously they had um, encouraged public to use um, trucks or four-wheel drive vehicles even, even during the motorized season. I think Derek's probably right in the condition of the road concerns. So could you take an HTV on that once rifle season starts? No. So I question the floor on this one four for access when yeah. we're having the motorized shut down uh, for the main season. If, if I read this right, uh, under five, they gave it a four. When I look at some of the others that actually have better access in other areas, they've gotten a two. And, and uh, so, you know, that one I, I kind of question, you know, because it's during the main season. So a lot of the time that it's open, we don't have a lot of hunting season going on or a lot of public uh, desire to get in there probably. And maybe Derek can explain why he gave this four with those questions. Yeah, so I think uh, we've ranked it a four just because we anticipate a little bit more use outside the hunting season with this particular property. Um, the American Prairie Reserve properties tend to draw um, other crowds, other recreational users, mountain bikers, horseback riding, bird watching, just outside of the, the hunting seasons. So that's why we did rank that motorized use during the, the summer months uh, a little bit higher than other properties where we suspect that the vast majority of the use you know, 95% or more is concentrated specifically during the hunting season, the rifle season. So then if you looked at the scoring criteria number six, if you take out general hunting season, would you still rate that as a five for the demand? Would I rank it a five without, with zero access during the general hunting season? Well, with the type of access that's being offered during the general. No, I'd still probably rank it a five. Um, 
there's a lot of use in there currently. Uh, previously, they were enrolled in our unlocking public lands. Is that correct, Jason? That's correct. Yeah. Um, but PALA is more applicable to these particular parcels. Um, but through that enrollment, through unlocking public lands and just observation of those parking areas, it received a lot of use um, and had the exact same um, motorized restrictions during the rifle season. I would say uh, every day of the week during the general rifle season, people were trying to access those parcels quite a bit on, on bike, horseback, and, and also on foot. So do you have any thoughts in regard to um, an agreement like this with APR and any positive or negative uh, you in the region in that regard? You know, I haven't heard the negative feedback that other regions might have heard as far as from the local communities um, or neighboring landowners. I've received zero comment uh positive or negative about involvement in an agreement with the american prairie reserve okay i think we should try it So I have a recommendation from Cindy to move forward. One last question in regards to that issue with the roads and ruining the roads when the weather conditions are such. Is there no other way to mitigate that, um, to control that and close it, close those access roads based on that weather rather than just a six months of the calendar year, it's not open. You know, that'd be extremely difficult. It's, they don't have anyone permanent, permanently uh, residing there on the ranch. So to be that responsive, to be able to shut down the road when a weather event comes in would be difficult. Um, in addition, just from experience with block management, it's, we don't have high compliance when we state not to drive a road when it's muddy or wet. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm in favor of moving forward with this, but I wish that we were down at least one area based on the questions of five and six. Uh, I guess I have a problem with the 41 points. I, I think it should be a few points less, you know, and I would let less heartburn if we're in that 36 to 40 point range versus the 41 to 45. I like that too. Agreed. Yeah, I was thinking more like down 38, 39. And that would be in the one down rather than 5,000, it's 4,000. It would cut the payment to 6,750. And uh, like I say, those two, I think are extremely high based on some of the others that I've looked at on the restrictions. Would that be a deal killer for APR, Derek? You know, I don't believe so, Dale. Um, okay. One thing that I, I will mention is this year they've enrolled the entire PN Ranch into Type 2 block management. Um, and something to recognize there is by enrolling several thousand acres of PN into block management, they've already reached their cap. So they're essentially enrolling that for zero compensation. So the PN private deeded land, FWP is contracting zero dollars for. 
for that block management opportunity this fall. Okay. I, I guess I would ask the question, being I brought this up, as a council, what authority do we have to go in and question the scoring and to move these payment numbers that are recommended to us? Well, it's just a yes or no, we're gonna go with it or not, or can we modify? That's something we need to know as we move through these contracts. Um, Ron, are you still available to maybe answer that question or perhaps Quentin? I mean, I can give my thoughts, but uh, you work more closely with the sponsor. What are, you, what are your thoughts? What was the question again? <laughs> the question is, what authority does the council have to look at these payments and, and our applications that are coming in front of us? Is it a simple yes or no we have to come up with? Or can we look at them and in this case, think that maybe they were scored too high based on what we think of the access and reduce or increase the payment? I think that's a great question. <laughs> I'm not sure I know the answer either. Um, I wonder, Ron, as we look at that, it seems so without looking at the statutory language, um, I'm inclined here to interpret recommendations broadly, um, whether those be footnotes or asterisks or, you know, captured somehow like that. And, and, and again, recognizing that the council doesn't represent the final decision here, but recommendations to be considered by the decision maker. So that, that would be my input. Um, as, as Ron, I, I sense you're, you're maybe reviewing statutory language and, and thinking on your feet some more as well. But that would be my input at this point in time is that recommendations to those sorts of details are available for the council to make. Whether they be acted upon remains to be seen. But again, as, as recommendations, uh, I, it seems to me you, you could make, point those out, those sorts of inputs. I, I would agree. I, looking back on the statute, it, it's just broad where it, it provides the PLPW the ability to review and make recommendations to the department. The department shall consider your recommendations when issuing agreements. So Quentin is, I think, in line. Yep. So I'd, I'd agree with that too, Ben. And I think you guys can make recommendations to the department and whether the director acts on those recommendations is up to the director. I'd agree. So the sounds like the group's recommendation then would be that this this uh, this project uh, will have some perhaps point total changes um, because of general season implications and then as a result of that we'll change the total score um, to be in that 36 to 40 point range and doing so will change the total payment from 77.50 to 67.50. Is that PLPW's recommendation? That would be mine. Agreed. Thumbs up from me. I, I agree. I, I concur. Yeah. Jason, I have one more question for you. We're going yes, through sir. the process and we're I'll have several more as we move along, but right now, uh, as we're going through these and their recommendations to the department, uh, when the final decision is made by the department, will we be provided with a copy of the finals in, that compare to what we brought forward? Meaning uh, we recommend 20 of these uh, if the department and the director disagrees with 15 of those and changes them, will we be provided with that information uh, so that we know uh, what the final outcome was versus what we recommended? Yes. 
Okay, thank you. Just making some notes. So for this one, I said approved, but would like to decrease change point totals to reflect a decrease in add additive criteria, meaning it would go down from that 30, that 36 to 40 point range. I think it should be put in there why, you know, based on the, uh, the access and the motor, uh, motorized vehicle access where it's closed to, to give to give a reason why we're looking at it. Yep, that's a good idea. So approved, but would like to see decrease or change point totals to reflect a decrease in additive criteria, 36 to 40 points due to lack of motorized access during the general season. Amen. All right, um, the next one. Scrolling down through here is a Betty Worley. Again, a, a, a block management landowner, uh, been providing access through her block management to um, this parcel of BLM, small, small, uh, small BML, BLM acreage, um, only 362 acres, but it will be motorized. And so here's, here's one of those where we have a motorized access during the fall hunting season to a small parcel of BLM. Uh, Wasn't this primarily, uh, didn't this primarily um, help bird hunters? Um, I don't know about the area, Derek. Do you have any thoughts on that? I guess I was actually confused by the statement that uh, up, about the birds the game approaching uh, the um, occasional opportunity for. Sounds like sounds like not much opportunity, Cindy. I don't know if it was my connection or Derek's connection. Yes, yeah, so it just depends the amount of cover in the fall active to bird hunters to actually utilize it. Um, if they So just from my standpoint, I, I look at this and there's others like this. And one of the one of the criteria that I just used personally was, would this be a destination point for a hunter? Would a, would a hunter drive 50 miles or you know whatever is reasonable for a, a hunter to go hunt a parcel like this? So we're looking at a little over 300 acres on this parcel. Uh, and would I, or would again, somebody, a reasonable hunter say, okay, I'm going to drive out here to, to hunt sharp tails, to hunt gold deer, to hunt elk. And I look at this and I just say, most hunters that I know would not, would not drive 
any real distance to hunt 300 acres of land. So when I look at this parcel specifically, I would say it's a, it's a no fund one. However, maybe a bigger issue and something that I've made notes on to talk about at a future meeting, when we are looking at these small parcels, unless there's something extraordinary about them, I really think the council in this next iteration needs to say, okay, when we're looking at these parcels that are less than a section, maybe we come up with a, with a certain amount of money that we're willing to pay the the landowner that I'm, that's allowing access into them and and i i haven't thought through that but i just look at this one and say man i i don't see i don't see where it's value added to pay this person thirty two hundred dollars to come into 300 acres it appears to be nothing spectacular about this habitat so my sense is as i look at this one I, I tend to say no, this is not one we ought to be funding. To me, this is the same one as number one with the state section. You don't know what's in there. And like I said, here this lady's in block management. It's block management 152, and if she pulls out everything, then you lose everything. Well, the thing about it is though, in that first one, you're looking at twelve hundred dollars. This one this one, you're looking at $3,200 to hunt, you know, 320 acres. I mean, it's just, it just seems to me the amount of money that we're paying for a chunk of land that's not likely not going to be a destination point. Is, I, I, I just don't think it's a wise use of our money. I, I, and it's not a matter of how much money are in the coffers. I, I just don't think that this is going to be a parcel of land that people are going to necessarily drive to to hunt. Well, I, I agree with you 100%, but uh, maybe we should knock it back to that 1250 because it looks like she's got quite a few sections from block management and she just says, well, take a hike boys and we lose all that block management. That's a lot of land. To go along with that, just regarding use of the block management area as a whole, it averages between 400 and 500 hunter days a year. So it is a, a high use block management area. And Derek, so that that parking point, that access, is that actually enhancing the hunting opportunity on the DMA also? Oh, perhaps it's getting you maybe an extra half mile into the BMA from the, the block management parking area, quarter mile, quarter mile. And if we compare this one because of the size of the uh, area there, the 320 acres or whatever it is, um, the cost to that is eight ninety seven an acre, versus the first one is a buck ninety five an acre. If you're looking at just accessing that acreage, um, I think that's our problem, Dale. Is is we've we've put that ranking. You know, we set up these criteria on item seven um, for the ranking for the size. And we've opened the door to that. And maybe we should have that begin at a different number and then always allow for an exception if it is a destination parcel, as you described, uh, that really enhances. You know, if this, if this was a bottomland and 320 acres of prime pheasant habitat, we wouldn't even be worried about it. So, Somehow, when we look at the quality of the hunting opportunity that's enhanced, we're, we're missing it here. Um, and then we're worried about the negative impact on uh, the enrollment. So this is a double bind uh, that we need to figure out how to remedy. And I suspect as we go through, we, 
we succumb to these realities and we set these presidents. So somehow all of these agreements this year um, need to have some contingency that uh, the whole program will be reviewed after the first year, um, after the experiment flushed out a little bit. I mean, we're only in for the one. <laughs> I think uh, perhaps one of the things that at least is showing up different. So um, this one doesn't have any uh, additive criteria. What the difference in price is, is the motorized versus walk-in access. And I think we've, again, realized perhaps that um, the motorized access needs to be more defined rather than a flat dollar figure. Um, you know, we had that discussion, I think, before, but then, of course, all the impacts that come with motorized access and whatnot. But that's what you're seeing here in the difference between the 1250 and the, the 35 or 3750 is that $1,500 motorized access component. Yeah, I mean, when you're maybe gaining a half a mile on a bird hunt opportunity. And I'm not knocking bird hunting. It's just that you're willing to work that half a mile, walk that half a mile anyway. <laughs> it's not a retrieval reality. You know, bird hunting access is a pleasure. Retrieval access is a labor. So we need to figure that out. I agree with all of that. You know, my concern still for is the block management implication, just like in number one. Because that whole section was 640, so this is a half a section. And so, like I said, what, what what did they gain in there? And I asked that question. They shoot one antelope off of it. I don't know if they shoot two birds off of this, but yeah, it's a. Well, I'm not going to drive far to go in there to have access. So, like I said, I don't really like that amount of money. It needs to be decreased. I mean, this kind of goes like the last one where. Commissioner Stuker was talking about the uh, scoring criteria, and that's the challenge of this. Every single one of these is pretty subjective. Um, and certainly the, the folks on the ground have a greater understanding of the, the benefit in that region. Um, but to me, again, five is very subjective to this one. Yep, it's motorized. Scored less than five because it's short and where's it going to? You know, maybe that's a, a two because of where it's going to and the size of the parcel. Um, and then the, the demand, number six, is questionably maybe a two also. So then you still compensate for that access but at a lower rate. Same thing. It is, but I guess I would, I would point out that again, if you look at our, our additive criteria, it's not until they hit 30 points do they actually add on the 3,000. So if it would have been a few points higher, you could be looking at 6,250. But in this case, the way it was scored out, you, you mean, yeah, we can. We can change those numbers or we can take your recommendation to change those numbers but at the end of the day it doesn't change the price okay unless we again unless you uh, would recommend we do something with that motorized component and and that one i think the regions were just trying to follow follow the criteria the dollar figures that are put to it so it's it's meeting those check boxes and that's that's how you see the valuation So, so Jason, do you believe at this point uh, we're locked into all these criteria? No. Or, well, I mean, for, for this for this for this year, you guys recommend however you would like to recommend the agency deal with it. the The, the defensible part is the hard part. So, if we if we come back and say, "Here's our scoring criteria, here's what you offered, and here's what it says we're going to pay you." And then we go back and say, well, we don't really think it's that good of opportunity. We'll, we'll cut it in half or whatever. I think that's 
that's probably in line with the statute. I mean, as far as being negotiable, but it puts all the department staff, of course, in an awkward position. Since it, since it's the criteria like the motorized, we have the standard criteria right now. I'd suggest that we either approve it or we don't, and then just when we submit all these, say that there'll be a redefinition of some of the criteria for next year for resubmittal. Yeah, I mean we have a. I think we have a real quagmire here because if you look. Um, are on on this assessment form item seven for the number of acres open. If we had one acre that's open and access is provided to it, but it doesn't enhance anything, then it qualifies. So that's our criteria that we've. And I'm not saying we'll get one acre, but we might get 40. So we could lose a block management area over a 40 acre disagreement. <laughs> Does that make sense? That's a real observation. Ed. Yeah. Well, I think that was my my doing because I was concerned about trail areas that might lead to uh, better access. So I'll take the hit. Well, but clearly, Cindy, there are agreements that have been made over 40 acres that open 20,000 acres that didn't exist. So that's where we haven't set the criteria clear enough to make exceptions for that type of issue. And we put them all in. So if we can't make those adjustments now, then I guess that's unfortunate that that's where we are from what I'm hearing. Well, I, again, I think you know, based off the language and Ron and, and Quentin can jump in, but you know, it's, it's a negotiable term. So. Yeah, I, I mean, it seems to me that, you know, again, thinking about the, the word recommendation, recognizing that this is the first time through for everybody. It, it seems to me that, you know, recognizing what issues or, or maybe we should rather say questions uh, in this first step is is a prudent thing to do, um, recognizing that, you know, to Jason's point, perhaps that sort of recommendation would 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 seem to run counter to earlier criteria and might end up being a, a right or a left hand turn um, relative to conversations that field staff have had with landowners if the decision if the director um, acted on those recommendations. But but I that being said, again, I think, you know, all this, as in so many other things, really is about a long game. This is a first fundamental step, and it seems like if there are questions now in this first step is the place to, or to make sure those questions are duly noted, those concerns are duly noted, and at least your recommendations are acted upon. Um, in part, uh, while the legislature, you know, obviously has the authority to and has has used that authority to put the program in place, um, and, and certainly not challenging that authority, um, but here we are today, you know, implementing that um, legis legislative language, and so it's the first day of a program implementation, um, and I'd hate to have issues and questions and not have them somewhere identified, somewhere manifest in recommendations, if not also implementation again. Um, all of us trying to find a first logical, consistent, consistent uh, with opportunity, consistent with, you know, statutory language um, as possible. For whatever that is worth, perhaps I'm missing the conversation, but that, that's where the conversation that I've been able to track it this morning takes me into today. I understand, Quentin, and, you know, I look at this like my business. We, we buy used firearms. And once we've made the offer, there is no going back on the offer. So one suggestion might be is that maybe we review the offer and come to consensus on the offer like you tried to do. Uh, 
before it goes to the landowner and take take the input of the folks on the ground um, because I do think that's the number one evaluation. The challenge is it's got to be statewide and I think somehow you have to look at the whole package of, of offers. Um, so, yeah, I mean, these offers are on the table. So if we go backwards, uh, it does create a real problem for uh, the staff in the field. So as we note that, you know, I think we need to consider how we do this in the future. I, Ed, I think that, thank you for that. I think that's well said, if I may, you know, and so perhaps just as an example, you know, perhaps, you know, that, that, that leads then to a, you know, a summary statement or two, um, you know, to make sure that the concerns aren't lost, perhaps also where it's fitting, where it, where it can be done without upsetting those conversations. It, it, uh, you know, it results in an, in recommendation for an annual contract. Perhaps that's, if some of those are long-term contracts, perhaps that's another decision space that's available. I, I really do appreciate the sensitivity to certainly stand consistent with, with law, um, legislative intent, and also, you know, being conscious of conversations field staff are having. The, the functionality I'm, I'm chasing here is just wanting to take good program advantage of, you know, the concerns you all see, that we don't lose those concerns, that we don't lose those questions. Uh, perhaps they don't result in adjustments to agreements um, but let's make sure we don't lose them, you know, moving forward to next year and the next conversations about um, whatever next agreements there are. I mean, looking at this one proposal that's in front of us, if I'm doing this right, um, this cooperator, I think Derek said four to 500. So 500 is 6,500 bucks on the DMA. So, if, if that's right, is that 13 times the 500, is that correct? Yeah, plus a few other things, but yeah, yeah. you're close. So, it's a huge investment, um, and that's going to catch catch on like prairie fires um, after we go through this first course. Um, so, I, I think we just be mindful of how this is going to work out after this year. <laughs> And some, some of, if I may, and I'm sorry, I'm taking probably too much liberty here, but you know, some of this, um, I wonder if there's also room here to talk about a mindset here. I mean, again, not all things are work in progress, thinking about a program that will hopefully will be successful um, across long time. Um, so I think it's reasonable for us to see this next legislative session as, you know, an, an, another next forum for how this idea and how its implementation is progressing. And, and uh, you know, there are some in this conversation that will be very directly involved in that, in that forum. Um, and, and so again, it speaks to, you know, maybe thinking about how, how to approach that. Um, I don't know how you measure that in this conversation, but, you know, it might, for example, um, being very deliberate about, you know, making sure we're consistent with the law, of course, I'm making sure that, you know, maybe it goes so far as to say we, we tried to uphold the conversations that field staff had. Um, but these are some questions that, that, that walking through that implementation bring to us. Uh, and, uh, making sure those circumstances and questions, whether they be characterized as issues or concerns or simply questions are, are visible to those decision makers as you know, they undoubtedly will be looking for an update to understand how that first stab at guiding language um, resulted in action on the ground. Well, and if I may, one final. So when we began this, I believe Dale Tribby brought a proposed theoretical ac uh, access agreement up along the muscle shell uh, that I think was kind of the driving force of this type of legislation which would have created access to multiple sections of completely closed BLM in Eastern Montana. Um, and so jump from there to here, 
And our first criteria discussion was how desirable is the um, public, the locked or inaccessible or under accessible land, how desirable was it to pursue? And now we're in the discussion of we might lose block management over a parcel that isn't very desirable for opportunity. And it's just a, a complete juxtaposition, I think, of how this intended to become. And we're on number four. So there's, your, there's my dirt bag. <laughs> I agree totally, I guess, Ed, because, you know, if we only had four or 500 people on there, there's quite a few sections in her land, so there must not be a total desire for too many elk and deer out there, so in any of it, but uh, that that's the counterpoint to it, but I, I don't know how to balance those. Ed, you know that? Yeah. It takes me full circle. I mean, I think Jason, uh, that comment prompts me, Jason, to ask you a question. And I know some of the access coordinators are on here as well, but you know, perhaps it's valuable at this point in the conversation to ask some of the access coordinators how they have portrayed this review um, in their conversation with landowners, recognizing that PLPW with, you know, was recognized as a body to, to review and offer recommendations to decision maker. And, and did, did in those conversations was it recognized that both the review and then of course the decision itself could change, um, you know the 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 proposals, not just in whether or not they move forward, but whether or not they move forward as those conversations defined. And the reason I'm prompted to say that, Ed, is I don't know what other um, that that seems to me to be a. a, a I wonder if that's a piece of the conversation as uh, from an agency perspective, you know, we wanted to make sure that this new opportunity was visible to all landowners. Um, you know, as we all look toward the next session. And again, part of that session will be a review of how this new opportunity um, went. Um, we, we wanted to be sure that the agency could say we were visible and Jason's done a good job making the program visible and all comers, you know, we engage them. Um, and and when, when, when I think about it in that light, um, I, I'm, I'm inclined to believe that in those conversations, parties recognize that, okay, into this filter comes all of the potential opportunities. And through the filter, only some of them will pass. So again, I do think there's some, some, some opportunity here for people to measure for people to recognize that conversations have left room for something different to show up than what was submitted. And so again, Jason or some of the access coordinators, maybe I'm all wrong. Maybe when in our conversations with landowners at the, on the ground, you know, we, we didn't send that message. Um, but if we did, and it does seem like, um, again, for, for some earlier comments, recommendations are available for the council to make. If it's, if it's not a good idea, for one reason or another, it seems to me like this is a place to make sure people hear that. This is Dale in Region 5. Quet and I did have those conversations with the three that uh, said that they were, would agree to that amount. Uh, I then pointed out that it would go to PLPW Council for their recommendation to either do it or not, and then on to the director as the final decision maker. And I, I pointed out to them that uh, that the offer could change at any of those steps. So Dale, Thank what's you. your opinion about their response? What's your gut feeling? I, you know, I think it'll sting a little bit if we come back with a little different offer. Uh, but I don't know that any of them would choose not to do it or to, to drop out of block management. 
Tim or Travis have any thoughts? Uh, I'm in the same boat as Dale. This is uh, Tim in Region 6. Um, I did convey that to the landowners that the, the price could change. Um, there may be a couple that uh, are, at least I know one that is uh, very interested in the payment. Um, and he's weighing whether or not he'll put his stuff in block management. If He'll only put his stuff in block management if the palace goes through. So. There is that. I think this program is going to have a major effect on block management as we move forward, especially when you talk about the payments, because we're looking at this one, it's 362 acres, uh, 3250. Uh, Tim Potter is there and he knows the North Plain that I'm in, I have 60, right at 6,800 deeded acres in that block management, the North Glen, which is somewhere I think around 80,000 acres with about seven of us in it. I get $3,300 a year on that piece. Uh, so you're looking here at, at getting that for 362. Other people in block management, I think are going to start looking at that as they hear about these as we move forward. And I know there are two different programs. I know they have two different statutes that's tied to them, but I think you're gonna see a lot more in future years of people say, why should I, and I'll use me, put in 6,800 acres, or if I can figure out where there's a, a section of unaccessible BLM land or state land, not state, but BLM, I can figure in my area, and get the same payment and not have to worry about uh, what all the motorized use and people running all over my other acres. And, and that is going to be a concern moving forward. Uh, I will address the motorized when we, as we were talking about it. As a landowner, I don't think there's a whole lot of difference between a half mile and five miles because I'm going to have the same weed problem and those type of things. So if I'm allowing motorized uh, vehicles on any property, I'm gonna have to go out there and watch the weeds and all of those things. So to me, I think that's why we put uh, 1500 on the motorized. It's a very good perspective, perspective to put it that way. Cause like I said, it kind of changes, you know, I, I don't know this country from Adam, you know, I know out in my area, but uh, yeah, if. I sure agree with you though. If you're getting that first, that many acres, and this is 3,500, it's to me, it's way over valued here. So, so to move on to this, to keep this conversation going, um, what would you, what would you think about doing uh, a flat rate? Let's just say so it's consistent for these small parcels that we're having trouble with. I'm just saying it's. Rec again, I'll let you guys make the recommendation, but at least in my mind, there becomes a, a flat rate for certain acreage sizes with exemption that the, that this program will, will, will compensate for, as opposed to trying to use something that maybe be set up for a, a much larger parcel. Cause I think there are some projects coming up. Um, and I'm hoping to get to those that will that will work with what we have. I mean, we, we've had we've had a couple I think that worked with what we have, and we have a couple now that don't work with what we have. So um, I guess that'd be maybe a possible way to uh, look at it um, more more fair and more consistent. It's just the, the we we've now established this new new flat rate. I don't know. I think that could be a good idea. Um, I also. What, what's our timeline here on how this moves forward and gets implemented on any of these that are approved through the department? Uh, they, they would go to the landowner for a signature, the director for a signature, um, and then we would be off and running. I mean, we've got people building maps now because a lot of them start in a month. And so that's kind of been our time crunch with this whole program this whole year is that we didn't have 
the ability to launch the program until May 1st. And so after May 1st, we had it open for basically six weeks, which then gave us about three weeks to get everything put together for PLPW and try and follow our process. And so I think there's some, there's some adjustments to process um, knowing full well, the, the hard part is who, when, when does a dollar amount go to a landowner? And so if we would have kept, um, kept our cards close to our chest and the landowner finds out through this meeting that this is the dollar amount that we're going to pay, then we have a problem. But if we don't present something to them initially, then they aren't interested in even having this discussion. So process has to be worked on. We know that going forward. I'm just trying to, to, to see where we go from here, I guess, this year. But, but my concern, Jason, isn't the urgency of getting this done right now. I mean, I understand it is. But my concern is making decisions that have a, a huge negative impact after this year. So my general thinking right now is, you know, we approve, we recommend, we're not approving nothing. We, we recommend to go forward on those that make great sense. And that's my feeling on it is, you know, like this one right here. If, if we want to go in and say 1500 is the access amount and, and those are where we set those bases instead of all the additive criteria that doesn't add up to anything really right here, I, I could go along with that. But to create a problem where um, I, I think recognizing that it adds some value, but it doesn't add, I mean, we're giving half the value of this whole block management to the access of this one point in this case. And therefore, as Richard so well laid out, every other block management cooperator is going to go, what am I doing here? <laughs> so yep. to me, we should move into these that make good sense. I don't think we had much issue with um, the AJ Curry Ranch and the APR, I mean, those made some significant sense in those areas. And I, I think somehow we need to figure out how to move forward with those that are significant and make a difference. And then we can chew on each of these that are so problematic. I don't know if that makes sense, if we need to reconnoiter that way a little bit, but every one of these is going to be painful if this is what it is. I have a problem too on that is part of the problem. We, we set the criteria and then we go back to the landowner and say, well, we don't like the criteria we set. And we think we, we set you up to get more money. So I know we have to work on that criteria for sure, but it's hard to backpedal when you've already presented something in there and, and our check sheet maybe was, was a little off. So we're, we're sitting here, kind of telling those landowners, well, we did make a mistake. And so we're going to try and correct it, but you're going to suffer too. That's, that's a problem we have by having set that criteria and maybe uh, not doing it quite right. I'm going to agree with Denley. I think we set the criteria. I think we're going to have to stick with the criteria this year, the scoring, that's something different we can discuss. But for as far as the criteria, I think we have to stay with it. Uh, one year contracts and change the criteria for next year if we think that's what needs to happen. Yeah, we, we could monitor I use too and just, we could monitor use and just go back to them and tell them, you know, this wasn't there for use. So like since the value for us is not that great. So. I'm, I'm going to have to agree with Richard on this one. You know, we set the criteria, say it's on, make sure that they understand that it's only for a year. It's not cast in stone and uh, it may be, have to be revisited next year. Uh, that way we're not hanging our people out, our field people out to dry. And uh, if we ain't made it, and it's not a huge amount of money that we're making a mistake with anyway. Jason, this is Quentin. I just take again another liberty here. I heard I've heard some comments, you know, comparing this 
uh, these details to block management. And, and I, um, at the risk of stating the obvious, and I'll apologize in advance, you know, I think internally, I know I've had some conversations where it was just for me, just a, a very deliberate step I had to take in my mind as I thought about these, these sorts of circumstances that by design, um, PAL is not block management. And so I do think, and I'm not suggesting this is what's going on, but just to, just to for, whatever, for whatever this comment is worth, um, as we all think about this something different now, um, I don't know how I don't know how much or if block management represents kind of a barometer of comparison here. Again, given the conversation that surrounded the development and ultimately the passage of Pala, it's a different tool, um, and it might be might be more reasons for us. And again, I'm not suggesting folks are taking wrong steps here, but just just thoughts about how to think about Pala. Perhaps it it might well be that um, you know the I don't know if recommendations or the decisions um, were ever meant to you know, make sure that this program's implementation was consistent with block management. I think uh, Commissioner Stuker is right. This is something different. Uh, I think it's reasonable to expect it to change in response, how block management might look um, in the future. Um, but I think it's also appropriate for this decision to recognize that the legislative body recognized that. So I'm going to agree with Quentin being he agreed with me a little bit there. Uh, I, I think we have stated that we think this is going to have an effect on block management. And I firmly believe that. But I also believe what we're charged with is to look at these individually of the other programs, as Quentin just stated, and come up with in kind of a bubble what we think these are worth based on our criteria. Uh, if we don't think they're worth what's there, then I think we should reject them, but not compare them to block management at this time. If we do that, we're going to be here for the next three days. I think we need to look at each one of these and say, uh, does it meet the criteria the legislators put out within the statute? Does it meet the criteria that we came up with back at our last meeting? I think it was January or February, maybe it was first of March. Uh, and, and evaluate these on those two areas and, and either say yes or no, or if there's a particular recommendation when we get into the points. Uh, but if, if they fall underneath the points, where that add-on is, then I think we need to pretty much do a yes or no if it meets our criteria. So what would be the recommendation then for this this project? I mean, I've heard I've heard both sides of the coin. I I do understand, I think the 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 problems, and this is what we're discussing now is problems that were identified long ago and the access coordinators and myself have, have struggled with over the last four months um, and, and recognizing again that this being one of five government, state government programs designed to open up public access to public lands. There's also now a, a private initiative doing the same thing, but um, just trying to move conversation along again, not trying to, to kill it, but it's, it's an issue that that is now coming to us and and there's not really a good way out other than recognizing there's a problem and addressing it for next year. Jason, there was a question asked or a comment made earlier in regards to monitoring the use. In any of these projects, is there a way to monitor use moving forward? Does the department have anything in place or is it, you know, and like in this case, it's going to be very tough I would think to say how many people actually went on to it with all the block management uh, around it. Uh, because, you know, if we could monitor use, then that would give future committees, councils, uh, a better idea, you know, because on block management, uh, they are supposed to evaluate them, I think, every year or at the end of each contract and come up with a recommendation based on 
several criteria on whether we should continue or not. Yep, that, that's correct. We, um, for this program, we don't have any use-based metrics um, in part because we don't have anybody that can go check boxes or collect coupons or, or any of that. We, we did factor in if a landowner did want to limit use, whether it be um, you know, only certain number of hunters a day or per week or however, just like, just like BMA. But um, as of now, we're trying, trying to get away from having to take the administrative piece of, of collecting coupons and having staff on the ground and drive driving vehicles and all that and the cost that comes with it um, out, of, out of trying to, to monitor this use, especially when it comes to year round. So a lot of these, a lot of these, even though they may be small acreages are open to year round use, um, motorized year round public use um, for hunting and fishing and other recreations. And so we, we don't have anything specifically outside the hunting season that would help us to monitor use. So where do we go with this, this one folks? Thumbs, thumbs down. I can't I'm inclined to say no. Okay. So. I think it's a lot of money, but I'm inclined to say yes, because they fulfilled our criteria. I would have to agree with Cindy. I, I think they fulfilled the criteria that we laid out. And so I'm going to say yes, uh, reluctantly. And I'd be the same way. I, I think, you know, we were trying to set a way to come up with priorities and, and the higher priority and getting the most uh, out of areas that were not accessible. Uh, but yet we laid out the criteria and sent it out there and, and that's how it fell. So I, I think we have to, at least on this one, uh, we have to go with it, I feel. So let me play this. So with block management, this parcel is not legally inaccessible. Is that correct? I believe so. So then in that case, since this person has been in block management, it doesn't even qualify in the first place. It qualifies because it'd be considered under accessible. This one is noted as legally inaccessible. And I think it, it is. is legally inaccessible. It is, I mean, it, it is legally inaccessible. I'm guessing that when they talk about legally or under accessible, they are not including block management in that decision. Somebody can answer that for me, but uh, if it was not for block man management, this is not legally accessible. And based on what the individual may have in their BNM BMA contract, uh, it may not be legally accessible under the block management even. That's correct. And there's criteria that are laid out that, that Jason provided us at the last meeting that talked about what constitutes legally accessible or, or um, limited accessibility. And uh, as I remember reading that, you know, again, their block management and, and PAMA are, are two different programs and uh, there's there's nothing in there that talks about access or i don't believe there's anything in there that says access via block management constitutes legal access i think they're strictly talking about if there is a public road or waterway that you can get to that parcel that's what constitutes legal access driving across or getting permission through block management does not constitute legal access that, that's correct. And that's been a department position as well through our legislative audit that the landowner can or cannot allow public access across the boundary of their block management area to adjacent public land. So 
So I've heard, I've heard a mixed results. I've heard mixed things. Um, this, this situation will continue to rear its head as we go through region five projects, um, which are looking at least on the table, like they're, they're about more money, but half the, half of the three sixty twos. So, um, It would be if it would be nice to try and renegotiate for about half of that amount. I think then, then it wouldn't be quite as much of a problem. But uh, renegotiating now might be a problem too. And like I say, because then we're sort of changing the criteria on both uh, your helpers and the landowners. That can be your recommendation, though, Denley. You know, I think Derek, you're muted. Go ahead. Oh, I was just saying you're, you're going in and out of service, I think, but you're you're good now, I think. Still sounds like you've got maybe some service issues or it's my end. I'm not sure which. Anybody else here, Derek, okay? I no. cannot hear Derek. <clears throat> Have to go back to the top of the hill, I guess. I think, um, again, I think that can be your recommendation that we go back and renegotiate as well. Or... Um, the acceptability of that is definitely on a case basis. Case no nope. no luck Derek I think I think what he's saying is that that it, it's landowner dependent right the relationship that you have with the landowner is dependent whether or not um, they're willing to accept a renegotiated um, I was just gonna say that like five and six it was Nope, still nothing. All right, um, we need to keep keep going. We're gonna be out of before we know it. So what would be the recommendation to the department from PLPW for this 362 motorized access to the BLM uh, priced currently at 3250? Based on what I said before, I would say yes, but to move things along, Jason, I would request that you just poll each one of the committee members. And if majority says yes, we move forward. If the majority says no, we don't. And that'll move okay. us forward. Okay. So we'll, we'll take votes on this one. Uh, Ed Bukowski, you're the person on my screen. Thumbs down. Uh, Dale Tribby, thumbs down. Commissioner Stuker, yeah. Uh, Ed Beal, I no. think that's it. No, okay. Uh, Representative Logie, if, if you can make the attempt to renegotiate, but I would others otherwise still say yes, okay. Uh, Carl? Well, yes, but look hard next year. Cindy? Yes, but I think we do need to look at the criteria. And all these people need to know there'll be a change. Uh, let's see. Um, I think we should make it clear too that it's not their fault that the criteria is changing. It's just a refinement of our of what we expected. I think that's everybody. Lee's still out there, or is he on there yet? Uh, he's not showing up on my list, so he may have hung up on us. <laughs> so that's. 
that's all I have currently for PLPW members. Uh, four yes and three no. Oh, all right. Say move um, on in. Yep. <laughs> all right. Um, so I'm going to make a note for this one. Okay. Um, so jump back in here and see if I can. So again, that same problem is going to have to come up again. So we'll probably have to probably do the same thing on a, a voting process. Um, the, the next one here is uh, the LF Ranch. Um, this one's providing some shoulder season elk hunting opportunity, if I'm correct. Uh, less than a section. Pretty good quality habitat. Uh, may help in some trespass issues. Barely met additive criteria. Hunting allowed for general rifle or August 5th, October 15th through February 15th for 1250. And um, because of the additive points, it, it made it up to 4250. So are there any, any comments on this one? Me, this seems to tie into an area that's got high elk hunting values. Um, just reading the write up, which I thought was very well done. It, to me, they, they really justified uh, why this property is of value. Um, yeah, the, the acres are only 560 acres, but boy, there's a lot of uh, state land and it appears to have the potential to be high quality elk habitat. So my thought is this is one that we need to have a thumbs up on. I would agree. I do have one question on the comment about excluding the archery season and therefore, however, creating trespass issues outside of the access dates may result. Um, can somebody comment on that? Oh. Yeah, I know uh, Derek was going to try and jump back into the meeting here. Um, let's see if I can. Derek, you should be good to go, I think. Anyway, the, the resulting, uh, from my understanding, Ed, it's, it's the corner crossing issue. Yeah. <laughs> Still having problems, Derek, for some reason. Um, so there's the, where where that parking area is kind of follow the the hash colors. There. There's a, a corner crossing issue that tends to happen um, there between those sections, and so let's say it'd be section twelve and section eleven. Is that this, but anyway. Coming off the, the main county road, uh, traveling through there, there's hunters that gone to the state piece, then they corner cross into the proposed pala. So that, that's been a, a historic problem they're hoping to avoid. Yeah, sorry about that. I think you're okay. You have anything else to add? So he's saying that because of this issue not being open during archery season, that corner crossing won't be mitigated during archery season. So there's there's some history of use issues, but sounds like generally folks are in agreement that this should move forward, even though it's a small size. Okay. If folks want to take a five minute break before we jump into region five, are we good to keep moving? Don't we have one more in four? Um, perhaps. We have the parcel room. Right. Yep, that's right. right. Yep, let's do that one quick. 
Sorry, multiple screens. Um, go ahead, Dale. Uh, you know, to me, this one is, to me, this one was the least justifiable of any of them on here. We're looking at three 40 acre tracks, scattered tracks of BLM for $2,000. Again, I go back to my comment earlier. Would somebody drive out to hunt, uh, especially you know, and if it were great pheasant habitat or bird habitat, maybe, but to drive out to hunt three largely separated or, or very scattered tracks, 40 acre tracks of BLM, um, boy, I just I just don't see it. I to me this is. Again, I of, of all of the submittals, this one I, I could justify the least on. I didn't like this one either. So it'd be a yeah, it'd be 120 acres. Um, 2000 was the scoring criteria that resulted, that's the price that resulted out of it. Um, hunting access, no motorized access, just uh, basically our base 1500 for year round hunting seasons, including um, the ability to hike bird watch camp for, again, it's year, year round hunting season. So. That's where the two thousand dollars came up with just using that same same metric. Um, so sounds sounds like we're close to saying no no on this one. No from Ed. I would say no also. Okay. I think that's more than four. So negative. That makes it five. Okay. And it's because of the price. Too small of destination. Okay. So I put PLPW not recommend move forward due to size of parcels. Is that good? It is for me. I, I just don't think it warrants funding for three 40 acre tracks that are very scattered. Okay. All right. It is 1055. Let's take five minutes and we'll finish up uh, five, six, and seven. And, and hopefully we don't have to have some of the same problems reappear. But we will. Thanks, everybody.
Rich. Yes. I I think uh, the political correct word for changing the criteria is refinement. I would agree with you. This is this is a pilot. Or it's a program, but it's really a pilot year, and we put forward the best effort we could, but we also understand once the applications start rolling in, uh, there's going to be some refinement moving into the next year as we see how the program works and what the applications look like. Don't you think the property owners will understand that? I think most of them will, but I'm sure there will be one or two that will look at it and say I should qualify under the criteria and they, they're probably right uh, based on what we put out there uh, and being we're, we're not negotiating or talking about the applications right now. Uh, my previous statement on the block management is where I think we're going to see the big problems moving next year. I hope not, but I think we will. Uh, I hope that we some have time somewhere along the line to discuss the block management program. And as we talked yesterday, some of the larger ones are not receiving the payments uh, on the number of, of uh, users they have. And maybe we should talk to the legislators again to see if, if we could raise that upper limit for the few that is needed to accommodate that uh, amount of usage. I agree. Uh, block management, if they combine the two bro programs and gave more money, it'd be a better idea. For it, uh, barring that, just raising the amount could be helpful. Well, and who knows, we may even see a change legislatively where they modify it there. So um, who knows? 
<clears throat> didn't we even hear some some of the bigger ranches broke off some of the prime ale cutting ground and left the areas in block management that's still getting maxed out i don't know that's a that's yeah, a catch 22 again all right um in an effort of time i don't see ed back but we'll we'll keep moving um again the same same problems uh tend to rear their head multiple times when you're dealing with this situation and so as we move on to region five um dale i believe is with us still i am okay um let me share my screen again here and then we'll go into region five projects um I think all of you are understanding the the dilemma that the staff uh, tried to wrap our heads around as we were implementing this program. It's just become it's become a lot of a lot of unknowns and a lot of uncertainties. But good thing we can always fix stuff next year, I guess. So the first the first two let me try to move my screen out of the way here um, are going to be uh, I think their brother and sister. And they're allowing access to cross each other's deeded land. And that's why you saw a couple other added forms on there. Um, again, it'd be for uh, year round hunting access uh, would include year round, I, I think at least, maybe Dale can correct, I think year round uh, motor or motorized access to also get to the public land parcels for camping, birding, hiking, other recreations. That's correct. Yeah. It's a smaller acreage, as we've discussed before. Uh, the, the scoring criteria comes out at $3,500. And what you're looking at is this first, this little south, south kind of west part of the existing block management area. Again, as discussed before, we would redraw the BMA boundary to exclude this, this BLM. Um, the landowner is allowing access from the county road, which ends close to the star, uh, motorized down through their, their private stuff to get to the BLM. Thoughts or comments or questions on this one? Again, Will it also back. include access to the um, BLM that's above it there by chance? That's actually a different landowner and a different lessee. And, and so that's where the brother and sister combination come into play is that there's one also for that other BLM parcel. Oh, okay. Good enough. Thanks. I'm for this. I, I just don't see the value here. Um, we're looking at 160 acres of public land for $3,000. Um, and maybe Dale can comment on this, but is is there anything spectacular about this parcel of public land that would be a destination point for people to drive just to that public land? I would say no. The, the uh, majority of the dollar figure came from the year-round access. The other access other than hunting and the motorized. That's where the, the biggest part of this one and then the next one, that's that BLM to the north there. Um, that's where most of the dollar figure came from on our assessment form. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So are we doing goodwill on this one so we get the next one? Is that my understanding? No, they're, they're two separate agreements, um, brother and sister. Um, you could recommend to do one or both or, or neither, uh, recognizing there is a family dynamic there. If you choose to do one, you probably want to look at the other one. That's what, I, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Is this uh, maybe a lesser value, but we give it, give it to them because of the goodwill for the other one?
Jason, did you say you'd be able to drive that road all the way down to that piece of BLM? Uh, I believe that's correct, right, Dale? Because the star's just the BLM piece, but if you had access to the Pala via that road, that that's that's a lot of area, uh, motorized area that that appears we don't have access to normally. So yeah, as Jason said, that county road ends where the black and white dash line ends. And then you go through one sibling's property, which is part of a different BMA, onto the uh, deeded ground of the person that applied for this particular pallet. And then you go on to these, uh, another sibling's property that has the pallet application for the, the uh, 320 acres of BLM just north of this BMA. Uh, there would not be any motorized access on the BLM because it's a pretty steep area, um, but my understanding they would be able to drive to the boundary of the BLM. Year round. Year round for any recreational activity, correct. So does that gray dashed road provide new access into that Block mat or BLM section? Uh, that's the road, just a road that goes up along the creek there, crosses it several times. And uh, coming from that road, you'd be able to, to uh, get motorized access to the boundary of the BLM, but there's really not a way to drive up onto the BLM from that road. No, oh, but is that gray dashed road? Is that new access? It's not it's, provided on the block management? No, it, that's the route into the BMA. And then another, actually, another siblings property to the south of that that is also enrolled in block management. So that's an existing road that is used for the block management area. So, Ed, you may have been out when we started this one, the, the yeah, it'd be motorized year-round access for all recreations to the to the 120 BLM that we're looking at right now within the boundary of the BMA. Um, the BMA boundary would be redrawn, um, and and therefore it would qualify for the program. Um, again, it's it's the value is in the year-round motorized access for all recreations um, per the per the assessment form. <laughs> And just as a side note, this is a sibling to the next Palo we are going to look at, um, which I think I may have included. What we ended up having to do with some of these were um, designated representative forms, meaning the fee title landowners giving permission to somebody else to either enroll in the program um, or receive a payment from the program. We have that right now with, with BMA as well. Um, so that's this this one here. I when I first looked at this, I thought that uh, dotted line was additional access. Um, now I don't really care about this. <laughs> So what would be what would be the recommendation? I guess I'm still a little unclear. Um, you said there is new block management added to it, and the the ability to drive further into it is that correct or no? No, that's an existing road that's usable by three BMAs right there, all siblings. Okay. Well, it's not a new road. It's not new access into 
any of the BMEs. I just showed that okay. just so there was reference of what the road, where the road was. Okay. So in the, the next one, we'll, we'll show you, it'll actually loop up and touch the other 320 or whatever that's on the north side there. So the road starts off the county road, crosses multiple siblings, private deeded land into the existing block management area, providing access to what we're looking at now, loops back north, goes on to the other siblings, um, property and providing motorized access to that other other BLM as well. But again, you can currently drive those in the block. That is correct. How much block management management use does this get this area? Do we have a recommendation for this one? I'll look. I'll look up those hundred days real quick too. Yeah. Does that creek bottom? Does it have pretty good water, birds and stuff in there? Uh, I it recently it does have good water in it. Uh, in a lot of cottonwood generation, new, newer well since about eleven and twelve, a lot of new cottonwood generation. But that's all on private. So um, I tried to focus this as just the public land that, that I evaluated and not consider what the private land uh, provided. Okay. Good, bad, or indifferent. <laughs> uh, this particular BMA that this pala is, is, has been in, uh, there were 400 and 900 days last year. And the lowest for the last four years was in 2017 when it had 343 hunter days. I think this just brings up again, you know, our criteria is uh, just problematic in terms of the payment. Um, and we're actually valuing the access to the public land higher than the access to their acreage of private land. And again, I'm just making the observation based, based on how we're doing this. Um, to me, they should have, they should have because of Palo, they should have an enhanced opportunity. It just seems that because of our criteria, where our criteria makes it inequitable between those two considerations. And again, if we can't go, you know, it, it would seem to me that the best thing in each of these three that we've struggled with would be to, um, adjust the, the payment based on the criteria or at the very least for me to be behind all this at the end of this we have to make it very clear that each of these agreements this year are one-year agreements and there will be changes in the criteria to adjust for the inequities i mean however we want to say it but to correct uh the inequities in, in, the, in the criteria, which is our problem. I mean, we created it. You're exactly right, Ed, because if I'm in this program, own that land, I enroll in Pella, 
let the hunters come in there by the droves, drive all the animals off to my private, and then I have a good hunting reserve myself. Yeah, and, and we, we certainly want these to have an opportunity on their own or certainly collectively. And uh, I guess we can't backpedal. That's, <laughs> we can't backpedal on criteria for payment. Yep. Uh, I mean, I've always thought in business, your first loss is the one to take because the next loss is bigger. And Richard said it earlier, I think, I don't have a crystal ball, but whoa. <laughs> I, I think as we just begun to chew on these, there's so many um, considerations. This to me is easier to say yes on uh, than the, the, the last one for 320 acres of nothing. Um, yeah, yes. And yet, so so if we're going to go forward with these in this manner, we better be very clear that uh, since we're the we're supposed to be recommending these or not, I realize the department is flushed enough to put a tremendous effort in. And I I do credit uh, the regional people making a concerted effort to do this well. Um, as the pieces of the puzzle come together, it becomes more clear the message that uh, could certainly be created here uh, in these actions. So for me, this one's easier than the last one. Any other thoughts out there? And it's your recommendation, so you guys can decide what you'd like to do with it. Uh, kind of like the last one, I, th I think we need to, unlike the last one, I think we need to approve this and send it forward because of the mileage and uh, based on our criteria that we have. I, I like, like I said earlier, I have a problem with the payment size, but we created that. So we need to make it clear, as Ed said, that all of these things are going to be looked at and it might be a huge change next year. Is, is there any way um, that, I know Quentin has made the comment that these are separate from block management and I understand that, but what we didn't consider in the beginning is the jeopardy to one or the other. And so as we go, is there any way to clarify, I mean, as we get into some of these others, you know, like, like the, uh, um, Terry, Terry Ranch that we did, Tom Terry, you know, that agreeing to this is based on renewal of block management. Is that even possible? I mean, we didn't put it in the criteria, but it's, it's an assumption I think we all made. Um, and I was on the break, I went and talked to somebody who's real familiar with that area. And, you know, his block management is valuable. <laughs> the one section we approved is not. So as we talked, you know, we, we, we did that really, I think, to maintain block management. So even though they're different programs, that was the criteria that was considered. So can we do anything to that effect that, you know, the improvement of SALA is also contingent on remaining in block management or no, or is that open up a can of worms in big areas? I think that opens up a huge can of worms, Ed. I do agree with you. I wish there was a way to do it, but uh, if we start putting that out there as a consideration, more and more people then I think will also be looking at, you know, pulling off, you know, because both of these pieces are in the block management right now. Yeah. And we pulled out to get the additional payment. And as Cindy stated earlier, uh, I wish on this program was rolled into the block management program and uh, a larger payment was being 
could be authorized, but it's not at this point. So uh, being this land is together, and that's where I had problem with the 120. It was 40 isolated in three different. Uh, I don't think we're going to require the block management at this time, but that might be something that we look at in criteria moving forward uh, with the changes we make on the others. Yeah, on, this, on these two, it makes sense that if, if they weren't in block management, would it? What was that, Ed? Or if these two were not in block management, these two related parcels here, would we be approving it? Would we be recommending it? I don't think so. I don't think so. <laughs> and that's something we should be looking at. You know, if 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 we're saying they're not in block management or associated with block management, then we shouldn't recommend them. That's probably what we should do uh, based on the program and our criteria because they are two different programs. And I know in the back of our mind, all of us are thinking, how's that going to affect block management? But as I stated earlier, I, I think we're going to have to Try to put that aside, make a decision, and then look at the criteria for next year and see how it's affected things. Yeah, and I think Quinn had mentioned that we, in our summary, we made clear that we have these questions and notes. And I think somehow noting that we gave consideration to the fact that these folks are cooperating in block management already. And that lends itself to a positive decision. Because um, I don't think it would be otherwise. Yeah, we in might provide a bonus point or something like that in our criteria for future. Yeah, we need to definitely change our house. <laughs> yeah, I know in the, the very first draft of our criteria, we had an additional $1,000 to block management landowners to keep their property enrolled in block management um, because of this fear that we had all saw coming down the pipe. But if you guys, if you guys are looking at the programs independently um, and would, would not recommend that these move forward, that again, that's just, that's a recommendation and that's, that's where we'll go. You know, it's not saying it's not going to happen, but it's just saying that's that's the recommendation from PLPW. And so I guess I don't want to pigeonhole you into saying you have to say yes because you don't. So, well, it's hard, it's hard from my mind to disassociate the two in these particular applications because they're so interrelated. You know, it's not like we've seen one yet that is actually accomplishing what I think the original was to go out and get this chunk of inaccessible or highly under-accessible public land by paying for access. I don't it's think coming. any one of these represented that. It's coming. It's coming. I know. And that should be easy, right? We got to get there. <laughs> All right. That's enough. Jason, I wonder if I, I want... I, I wonder if it's worth pausing again and summar summarizing uh, to the council, um, you know, how, how the legislative discussion heard some concerns about this sort of interaction with block management and move forward regardless. Uh, that is to say that there was recognition that this kind of interplay would potentially, if not likely happen and, and, and still the statute came forward as it did, that being that being reasonably interpreted as uh, as yeah, tolerance, um, and and again, uh, I think further reinforcing the the effort, difficult as it may be, to keep the two programs separate in our deliberations here. I understand, Ed. This there's, that's easier said than done, but I, I just wonder. And maybe Jason, your answer is no. The count we've talked about that before in this venue, and there's no need to 
remind everybody that's just old news restated again. But again, it, looking at this, there's another, I hear the council talking about changing criteria next go around. There's another change opportunity on the horizon too, whether it's taken advantage of or not. And that is what the legislature will do with you know, the implementation experience of this program. Um, and one of the possible answers is that block management is adjusted. Um, and that Pala is seen as the right one and block management is the one seen as that needs some course correction then in response to Pala. Don't know that and I'm not suggesting an advocacy. I'm just painting that, I'm just painting a, you know, a, just trying to paint a spectrum of what the future might look like here. Um, coming back to the decision today, it just seems like the council is doing a good job of, of uh, you know, trying to look at these two options for landowners independent of each other. And it seems like the best way to do that is still hard, but the best way of all the choices is to look at you know, the, the, the access opportunity um, in and of itself. Is it a good access opportunity or not? Or whatever that's worth. All right. No, I think that's right, Quinn. <laughs> We are going to have to move ahead. So I'm going to say yes on both these next two because they're kind of related. Do we need to do another roll call vote? Yes. Is that a yes or a yes to the <laughs> project? I think yes, we need another roll call vote. Okay, all right. Uh, Dale, you're up first then on my screen. Nope. Commissioner Stuker? Yes. Ed Beal? Yeah. And again, just so we're clear, we're looking at both projects together. Uh, Representative Logie? Yes. Ms. Cohen? Yeah, I guess so. Um, you know, in that first parcel, it really doesn't have it doesn't give you access to the BLM close though. It'll, I think it's because of the scale of the map, you'll have access to the BLM motorized, at least to the, the boundary, right, Dale? Okay. That's my understanding that you'd be able to drive to the boundary of the BLM, yes. Okay. Uh, so Cindy, what would be your, your vote on this? Yep. These two and then Carl, you're muted, Carl. Still muted, there you go. Yes, on both. And then uh, Mr. Bukowski. Yes, all right, looks like, Yep. All right. So yeses take that one forward for both of them. Rec recognizing one year agreements, recognizing the, the need for probable possible changes. Um, I think that recognizing the one year agreement has to be on everything. Uh, yeah, there's some that are requesting longer term agreements. And so that's part of part maybe the discussion. Well, as part of that discussion, we don't even know we'll have the money for 10 years. So I, I, I don't think we should do anything about one year. Well, by, by arm we can. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, all right, moving on then to uh, Sunset Colony, the B2 parcels of uh, DNRC uh, was accessible via BMA, uh, 1,280 acres, I believe, for 2750. Zoom down and I'll share my screen again. My computer's acting up funny. So.
Question for Dale. This um, North Gage Road, is that a public road? Uh, it ends where the green triangle is. That's our BMA roster box. And that's where the county road ends. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thoughts on this one? So then again, Dale, the uh, access is new access into that? No, those roads showing on the BMA map are currently open for BMA users. So on this one, uh, the applicant, Sunset Colony, doesn't want the pallet to open until October 1st because of a possible anticipated uh, conflict with someone who subleases the DNRC and runs cows on there and Sunset Colony is worried that that may cause an issue. So that's why I adjusted the value for the hunting access to 750, I believe. I, can you put your screen up again, Jason, or I can open up the- That is correct, 750. Uh, yeah, that's I figured, correct, yeah. I figured that October, November, December, part of the hunting season, if you will, was 75% of that September 1 to January one time frame that we're, we were using for the $1,000. So I adjusted that to 750 with that uh, thought process. I would say we go ahead with this one. Any other uh, opposing views? If not, I'm just making a note, uh, recommends to move as proposed. for Sunset Colony. Okay. Um, thanks, Dale. Now we, get, now we get into some that were landowners looking for um, longer term agreements. Let me bring my screen back up here. Sorry, I had to shut down there for a sec. I, my whole Zoom closed, so I was kind of nervous. I lost the whole meeting, but I'm glad you're still here. Um, so the next one uh, will be uh, part of a complex. Um, I think uh, Tim Potter's still here to join us, uh, Region 6 Hunting Access Coordinator. Is that correct, Tim? Still around? Yeah, I'm here. Yep. So this next one is um, kind of a network of of access roads and a huge chunk of BLM. If I when I clicked on it before, I think it was like 338,000 acres of BLM. So it's a huge chunk, not currently enrolled in block management. Um, the first one here will offer some uh, fishing opportunity. We used to stock that hose reservoir, but we didn't because of the access uh, conflict or understanding if there was um, good public access to it. So it'll have a hunting and fishing opportunity, very large chunk of public land. The, the pipeline road that you see on your map going through kind of the middle there is a private road. So the landowners opening up motorized travel to the hose reservoir as well as offering um, access, motorized access to all the, all the BLM. Um, because of all those things and the scoring criteria, the region uh, assessment form is, is suggesting a total of $10,000 for this one agreement. I think this is the first one closest to what Pala was supposed to be about.
So I have a question for Tim. Yep. <laughs> when we look at the Bitter Creek WSA, I understand when you look at the definitions that are associated with PALA for what constitutes accessible lands, um, they need to be accessible via within two miles by a two wheel drive vehicle. Understand that. However, when we look at Bitter Creek, is there not access throughout Bitter Creek without coming through private lands? Uh, <laughs> so you're asking, is there legal access to the Bitter Creek for the public? Yes. Not, uh, no, there is not legal access for the public because that does go through private land that does not have public access. At, at these points, but how about other spots? I, I was understanding that on the east side, there are two track trails that come into the Bitter Creek WSA that essentially network with, with the roads on the public land. Uh, they may not be the best roads, but there is access to them. Is that a correct statement or not? And I, I do not know. I'm not very familiar with Bitter Creek. I, I've spent a little time up there, but very little time up there. No, uh, every road that I have seen on the, that goes through, that they have a numbered road on, has to go through a public, or through private property. Um, so legally, I don't know if those number roads are legally accessible anyway. Um, if you see, Jason, if you go back, down. Um, down or up? This one? Yeah, the one that shows the the middle of the Bitter Creek. This use this is called the pipeline road. There's a, a pipeline, a gas pipeline that comes through here, and the public used to think this was a county road. There is no petitioned road for the county um, on this uh, pipeline road. Um, it goes through section 11 um, from the east. I don't know if you put your, uh, did you put the big map on, Jason? Um, I think that's what I was looking for was to go, so this one here maybe? Yeah. Yeah, kind so, of. yep. So there is access from the east to, but then you get to Bertal's uh, private and there is no way around the private to get legally to that uh, middle bitter creek that has access to um, to the numbered road system. Okay. Thank you. And then it's the same all the way around the the, the WSA. Um, it, it most of these roads go through private property, um, so I can see probably more potential palas around this WSA coming in. So the the first agreement that we're looking at is the blue line kind of on your map um, where it crosses the, the private land there on the west side of this large chunk of BLM would take you into where the blue line stops and meets the purple line because you're, again, you're crossing private land there. Um, so there, the purple line is actually a BLM numbered road that is on, which would be, I think, agreement number two um, for Bergtals, and that, that actually has a BLM numbered road, but there's no legal access for the public. Uh, agreement three is, is kind of the red line that takes you down through the middle. Again, motorized travel through private land, also connecting you up on the east side um, with the county road. And then a different landowner, but sibling uh, would be the kind of a turquoise colored line that's actually been connecting kind of the whole road network um, through through also their private land um, and, and that's enrolled in block management. So the first consideration, I guess, is this blue line going up through uh, motorized through private pipeline road to Hose Reservoir, which is this spot where my cursor's at, taking you at least to this point where the purple would, or to where that access would then cross private land again um, 
you know, this one we kind of struggled with how do we define what's a parcel or how do we define what's an agreement? And, you know, we, we kind of came up with multiple access routes and benefits to the public going north, going south, all motorized, um, something that the public doesn't have access through this whole network. And again, the larger size of it was like 338,000 acres. So it's definitely improving public access. Just for curiosity, Tim, why weren't the first two uh, included in, in one uh, proposal? Was well, it? <clears throat> uh, that was where I struggled with uh, what is a parcel. Um, legally, the landowner could shut it off from both sides, uh, especially getting to that hose reservoir or up into the middle of uh, Bitter Creek. Um, so uh, I struggled with, is this one, two, or even three on this uh, northern section of uh, Bertal's property um, because they can shut it down um, from either direction and cut off access up into the, into either hose or up into the middle of a bitter creek. So. And I asked that question numerous times and um, this is what, I guess what we came up with was two, two projects for this one. Thanks, Tim. Yep. Uh, I agree with Cindy. This is what I envisioned or hoped would happen uh, with this program, larger tracks. Uh, so I have a question. He's asking for a 10 year agreement. Uh, it was brought up earlier uh, on the money side of it. So what does the arm say, Jason? We can, we can do agreements up to 10 years. Does any restrictions have to be placed in the language uh, if it's defunded by the uh, legislators on this program? Uh, how would that and where would we come up with the money then to make the payments? Because uh, we're having a legal contract is my understanding. We are, and, and ARM is actually written so that it's dependent upon availability of funds. So, so we we could do it. We could do a ten-year agreement, but if there's no funds allocated to the program, then they they wouldn't they wouldn't be paid. And it's the same the other way. Is if we did a ten-year agreement, and we we paid them um, every we will pay them every year. We get to, to year six or whatever, and they drop out. They can drop out if they want to. Um, just like just like your existing BMA contract. So I just wanted to be certain that amongst these three, because they're definitely interdependent, um, we're one hundred percent sure on the road statuses in regards to. Um, there's nothing here in question about public roadways. Yep, I've uh, been to the county road department. Um, there is no petitioned route through this pipeline road. Um, a few years in 2015 or yeah, 2014, we had uh, this property was in block management, uh, not due to their uh, willingness to be in the program. Um, and uh, after that, uh, sent, it was actually a sentencing that the judge ruled that they had to uh, allow public access for five years through their sentencing. And 2014 was the last year for that. After 2014, the roads were shut down. Um, and uh, that, so that's when the concern and conflicts came. Um, for the public, so legally accessible to that middle of that Bitter Creek was shut down legally. So, um, and I, the BLM has no legal public access on there. I've been in contact with uh, the field manager here, and uh, yeah, that from the due diligence that I've done, this I cannot find a public right of way. 
and certainly this travels through pretty much its entirety as far as the access point. Yeah, yep. And it will be motorized year-round access for all types of recreation, which the BLM, um, you know, that it's their wildlife study area that they they want bird watchers up there. They um, want other recreationists up there. So. Well, my concern is with three agreements with one landowner, just the math on here in 10 years, we could pay them over $300,000 for access into here, which seems like a huge sum of money. And especially when we have three payments going to, I think about 20, to the net, to the extent of about $25,000 a year to one landowner. And I just find that interesting. And uh, I don't know, I, I don't know that I'm comfortable in saying that we have three different agreements here. I mean, it's what, what keeps anybody then from saying, well, this is a different road. I, I want a different agreement with this. I, I don't know what the criteria that was used to say, okay, this, this constitutes a different agreement. And, and, and I'm struggling a little bit with that. Yeah, I think, I think we all struggled with <laughs> as we work through these kinds of a projects. I guess I, I would agree with Tim in a sense that if the landowner decides to shut down access either on the red line or the blue line or the, or, or whatever, there's, there's no access from that point on. So you could get to, you know, you could drive in um, to the BLM, but you're not going north on the, the road going north, or you could you could uh, drive into the private on the wet, on the east side, but you're not getting to Hose Reservoir. You're not getting through two other chunks of private, whether you're coming from the west or the east. Same going south, right? Is you, know, you can get to that that piece, but you're you're stuck. So we kind of kind of said, well, at any point that the landowner can shut it down, well, there's possibly for a new possibility for a new agreement. Um, right or wrong, that's kind of where we came up with how we struggled through it, I guess. And to be clear, I mean, we, we checked up on the, the 15,000 per agreement. And that was, that was the, the sponsors and the bill legislature's intent was that it's 15,000 per agreement, not per landowner. Um, you know, Ron, you, you and Dustin Temple had some of those conversations, but. I think this one is one that we actually showed the sponsor and this and, and he was in agreement that it would be three separate projects. So in that regard, Ron, has the sponsor looked at most of these? Uh, not most. We just showed him a few that we kind of had concerns with that we weren't sure on, like this one where it was um kind of unusual um and so yeah not all of them but just a, a handful and so each one of these three is the same landowner totally the, yes the blue the blue line the purple line the red line are all one landowner uh the, the teal or whatever turquoise, turquoise one is a is a different landowner different project that's the Bladesburg Tall Laundry Hill project. Um, but the other ones are those three uh, pri previously, the, the Hose Reservoir, uh, I can't remember the other two are called, but let's see. Yeah. Eagle Creek and- Middle Bitter Creek. Middle Bitter Creek, so yep, yeah, so there's, the first one you're talking about is, is the, that first one coming from the west um, that crosses private land here to get to the pipeline road, which also offers that hose reservoir access. Yep. And the reason why we're trying to get this into a multi-year contract uh, is because the fisheries department, if they're going to stock these reservoirs, 
they want a multi-year contract because um, they, they they can't stock uh, prairie ponds for one year at a time. So. What kind of hop hunt, hunting opportunities up in there? There's a lot of elk, deer. Uh, it's mule deer, upland birds. Uh, very, very, very few uh, elk, but there has been an elk or two uh, harvested out of the Bitter Creek area. Um, but it's more of a wandering uh, elk than than a okay. actual elk <laughs> population. So. Basically, mule deer then. Yep. Well, I'll there, just throw something out. Some, throw something out here since I was at several meetings and I keep bringing up this pain in the butt thing that I have trophies west this year for a one-on-one -on -one mule deer getting 8,500 per hunt and they had 160 hunters last year so put her all together getting 13,500 for an elk hunt so that's down here at Cold Strip Road so that's my rant Jim this is Quentin just a clarification, I heard you talk about, if I understood correctly, the department stocking ponds. And as a, um, could you clarify if I, if I understood that correctly, as a condition of stocking private ponds, is not access already secured for fishing at least as part of that effort? Um, I guess this would co constitute as access for that arrangement. Um, I don't think they have, I, they might have a program of their own that they, uh, get access to that as well, but this would constitute as the access for stopping that. that Thank result. you. Dustin, do you have any other comment on that? Uh, yeah, Jason, so there's, there are a handful of other programs that we can, engage in with landowners um, for access. The private lands fishing agreements is common that we, that's how we get access to private ponds, but then we have a stocking arrangement as basically the, the payment. So I'd say that's probably our most common method of, of a stocking for access type arrangement. So again, just for awareness, I don't know how to, hearing that from Dustin, I don't know how to measure it or if it needs to be measured um, by virtue of the department putting fish in and the landowner accepting those fish, there is an access requirement inherent in that agreement. This is the BLM. These reservoirs are in BLM land. Is that what you said? Okay. Yeah, Thank it, you. it's Thank on you. BLM. It has the BLM even has a huge uh, sign that says hose reservoir on it because um, it was stocked at one time. So. Currently, there are no fish in it. Is that or very few? It's not a destination point for people to fish in at this point in time because it hasn't been stocked because of a lack of access. That is correct. Uh, the fisheries manager was going to try to get out there and sample it this week. And um, he thought maybe we could get fishable fish in there this year if this went through. Okay. Thank, on, you for, thank you for that clarification. Sorry, I missed that. Based on the comments, I think we should approve the three for uh, uh, Mr. Daryl Bergtall. Yes, for Daryl. Others? I, I'm okay with it, but I, I, I still have a lot of questions on this that I don't think we're going to clarify until we start re looking at some of the criteria on this. And, and I think that's what I heard from <laughs> the couple members. We need to be looking at different, you know, re looking at our criteria and 
with the idea, and, and I hear what you're saying, they don't want to stock a, without a long-term agreement, but certainly these agreements, as well as all the other ones, we need to look at them, you know, in the next couple of meetings before next year. And uh, I don't, I don't know how that plays into this, but I know they have expressed a desire for a long-term agreement. Um, but I think on any of these, we need to probably be be back looking at some of the criteria on some of these and uh, and have the ability to make tweaks. But I'm I'm for approving it, for approving these three. This is Ed. I'm approved uh, for approving it also. You know, guess my theory goes back to Trophies West. $8,500 for a mule deer, three mule deer come off this place. They would lease this place in a heartbeat. And this is exactly the type of thing we need to open up to hunters, just thousands of acres. So, yes. Okay. So the question is, is the recommendation for 10 years? I heard Dale say we need to look at this uh, in another year or two, but that also makes it tougher for the fisheries to start stocking if you only got a, a one-year contract. I would be in favor of the 10-year uh, just to tie it up because I don't think anything's going to happen to lower it. I think any of the prices are continue, going to continue to go up. Same here, 10-year. I'll agree. I'm a, I'm a yes on the, the projects. Um, I am a little concerned about the tenure. I mean, the, that particular agreement with the Hose Reservoir is based primarily on that, and the rest of it's primarily on hunting. So, you know, I guess I'm, I'm a little on the fence on that tenure. It, it would be great to see how this works for three years and or a number like that. That's just my comment. So we've got, it seems like we have a pretty good idea that the, the three projects will move forward. It's just now a length of time um, that you would recommend the department uh, proceed with. I've heard three years, I've heard 10 years. Any any other thoughts? Better grab it while we can. Yeah, like I said, this uh, landowner, we have not had a very good re relationship with them um, before, and they are starting to come around to allowing access through the, their property. So, um, and if they're willing to go 10 years up into a very high demand, uh, wildlife study area that, that's exactly the way i look at it <clears throat> again back to trophies west they take in over a million bucks every year like i said they've got over a million acres lo locked up down here on rosebud creek and sarpy creek so yeah they got money jason i defer to tim on that preference okay So that'll be those those three agreements and uh, the Hose Reservoir, Eagle Creek, and the Bitter Creek, Middle Bitter Creek. Um, all three are recommended to move as proposed uh, for 10-year agreements. Again, that, that's subject availability to department funds as authorized by the legislature. Okay. Um, so then the the next one will be a, a berg tall as well, but it's a uh, must be a sister or something. Tim? <laughs> no, it's his his son. Um, his son. Yeah, he's just starting to okay. uh, start taking over the ranch. Um, he is a younger fellow, um, so uh, he bought this property probably a year ago or so. Um, so that's what it is not, would would not be in block management. Uh, it's very small acres across the private, but 
Uh, again, it's a numbered road that go uh, for the WSA, and then it would connect to Daryl's uh, Palace for motorized access year-round, access for hunting, uh, not fishing on this part, but um, bird watching. Um, they do have sage grouse up there, um, so sage grouse lack and uh, um, uh, horn hunting too. So. So it does go through their private property, uh, just 40 acres there on the um, north end of that chunk of private. And it, that is a numbered road, that purple one that goes through number 35. Um, so and then it would connect up to that Dale Bertal Pala. So, so is, again, is there no other access around it? Uh, so this would, this follows under the un, under accessible, um, there is a county road that comes to the south, but it's, uh, with this motorized vehicle access, it does get you closer into that stuff, uh, that BLM farther out there. So, um, did I answer your question? Sorry. That's the light blue one. Yeah, you have that 3.3 mile. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so you, you go through their private property and then the BLM's got their WSA big sign, branding sign that they put up. Um, but legally there is no access to that, to that sign. Um, oh. so. And Sorry, you said in that area? Ahead already get egress through there or no? What's that, Ed? Sorry. Do the hunters uh, in that area get egress through that 40 acres or no? Uh, not legally. Okay. So we have that road that's south of this parcel of a private land on the south right where your cursor is and there's a road below there um i think it's called the bear creek road and then it turns into the laundry hills road and i see a two-track trail that takes off and goes north just just to the just to the east of your cursor there uh, and east of that chunk of private land um in section four or five, and then it goes up and, and hits a trail that goes through the Bitter Creek area. Yeah, we don't have that access that goes to the north and west off of that off of that private land, but it appears that there's a, an access road that does take you up into the Bitter Creek WSA and takes you quite a ways up in there. Is that fair or not, Jim? Yeah, yeah. So this is the access into that 32, 33, and 34 sections along Horse Coulee there and Spring Coulee. Okay. And then the upper sections of two, three, and four um, gets you within that two mile or uh, enhances access in that two mile access. Um, otherwise, it's two miles off the bridge road, which is farther south of um, where the pallet begins. So. And that's why it's under accessible. Um, that's was our thought. So. And then <laughs> with the connecting with the other palas of Daryl's, uh, this will get you a whole day uh, round trip um, of hunting so. and bird watching, uh, horn hunting throughout the, the whole the whole year. So instead of having to go up to Daryl's, up to that red line, and then have to turn south again. So. Thoughts on this one? Is that a road right through the middle of Newberry Flat? Yes, that's the county road. And so that doesn't None of the, this pala is the stuff to the west. Mm -hmm. Hmm. So 
the other three somewhat contingent on this one? Uh, no, not necessarily. It's just uh, um, it connects a numbered road for the BLM. And then uh, if we had all three of them or four of them, it gives you a heck of a day out in the country. Yeah. It is very good uh, uh, country, uh, very good mule deer habitat. Um, that ash coulee, horse coulee, there's some deep stuff back in there. Um, uh, so. Yep. If you would move back up on the map, I, I think Ed asked the question, that's a county road up to the next section. On the east side, yes. On this, this one here, Rich. Yeah, right there. Yeah, That's there's a county road that goes through there. So that goes right through the the piece we're looking at up there from the north. No, we're not that far up. We're we're looking at the this piece right here. Okay, what's the line that kind of cuts through that upper east one? There's a white line that kind of comes across, hooks the red line and the light blue together right there where your cursor is. What is that line? That's a county road. Okay, so that comes down and it does go through that, that gray section up there, which is one of the access that we're looking for. Right there where your cursor is. No. Yeah, no. You, can, you, can, you can ignore the, the east side of this. Look, just focus on, focus on this one. I, I saw Tim's line going this way, so I thought maybe it was <laughs> part of it, but. That's just another numbered road, uh, ridge road for the BLM's WSA, that one on the right there. That, so that's focus, that's focus not part of the, this. yeah, that's not trying to get into, because um, that's all legally accessible. This is stuff to the west. So we're looking at the one down in the bottom of the U and the one to the west over there then are the two pieces we're looking at. Yeah. Just, exactly. this, just this piece right here. And yep. to the west. I can I can bring it back to this map. So we're, so you're looking at a zoomed in picture of the same thing. So it's this this piece right here that is a value to get to this BLM numbered road. And this is the the dash blue line is the guy's uh, grazing lease. They all. Is it typical that a BLM numbered road dead ends on both ends and was never public on the other end? It's not unheard of. It's the same thing down here in the Custer Forest. Road right in the middle of forced into private and picks it up on the other side of 30 yards of private. Yeah, I, I was very surprised. I've lived here my whole life. And then once you get into what is legally accessible, it's, I mean, it's amazing how many roads are not legally accessible, so. I'm gonna and, say we could approve it. Okay, first and a second. Was it one year or, or 10? This one, the landowner's interested in a 10 year as well. Since it's a kind of a family deal, it might be a long term for us, a benefit keeping it in the family too. I, I'd say yes. I'd say yes. I think these folks yes. have got to figure it out. Yeah, and they have a lot more uh, other BLM uh, that's legally inaccessible to you, farther to the north along the Canadian border. So this may be one or four of many to come. I'm um, yeah. Okay. Now into uh, Mr. Browning's. So we're looking at, uh, by the way, I did, we did have a, a, ten, a noon uh, public comment period 
on the agenda. There are no public attendees, so we're just going to keep rolling. Um, Mr. Browning, 10 Deer Creek, uh, 960 public land acres, uh, kind of checkerboarded. We've had some, some game damage, but otherwise, um, smaller parcels, but does create opportunity to get access to them. Um, I think the, the total score came out to be around, uh, what was it? 30 points. So it's right on the line of, of reaching that next level of additive payments. Total of $6,500 one year and you're you're providing access basically to checkerboarded BLM DNRC. So I see this one has been checked that there's been no research done to determine whether there is a legal accessible so maybe Tim or could explain. Yeah, uh, if you go back up a little bit, uh, this P, PT 160 road, that is a gas tax road, that is a county road. Uh, that's the black and the white checkered, um, but that is the only legal access. So uh, that purple road on the section 10 that would be legally accessible up until the private property on um, section nine um, and then uh, they would allow a uh, motorized vehicle up to the state land. Uh, state lands would not, isn't this road is not open to uh, public recreation. So that's why it's a walk-in from there. So. But it is year round access open for all types of recreation. It is very good habitat. Um, it's the McCone Breaks habitat it's all native it is not crops or, or anything mule deer upland birds there are sharp uh, sage grouse lecks out here um yeah. it is currently not in block management uh they will not enroll in block management unless the uh, uh, palas are approved too so um but if the palas are approved they will be the hunters will be able to access the private land as well. So that that brings up a question then. You know, right now, lands that are not in block management, generally you cannot uh, drive across the state lands. However, if they're in block management with the agreement of DNRC and the, and the lessee, they can drive across state lands, at least that's how I understand the rules. If they, go into, if they go into block management, will they allow vehicular access across section 16? Uh, I can't answer that. Uh, Travis could probably open or answer this for the Miles City office, but um, just because it goes into block management does not mean that the state lands will open it up for vehicle access for uh, the public. So. Correct. Yeah, this is Travis. Um, yeah, our state lands office here, at least through block management, they are willing to open up the state land to vehicle access during the term of the agreement if the lessee is willing to do that as well. So ultimately it's up to the lessee, but the state lands office is willing to allow vehicle access on the state land. Okay, so we may be able to extend that road down to uh, all the way to section 22, that be aligned. I just thought it was better hunting too, if we had a parking area up there, but what, maybe with game retrieval through that. that road, so. I mean, yeah. Hey, is it fair, Tim, that this area is really a mule deer area? I mean, I'm, I'm sure there's some upland game bird hunting that takes place, but generally this is 
is the the majority of the hunters out here are hunting for mule deer and then along with that isn't that a limited draw area where these are this is not a general area this is one of those areas uh that's that's by permit only yeah for mule deer yep and then there there's antelope um use and there is very good uh, cover for sharp tail uh, okay so it the bird hunters will use it. I heard I heard one one in favor. And the others. Yes. Yes. I'm fine. Yep. Yes. Okay. Where where is this area north of? North of Flowing Wells. So, about, Mr. Go ahead, Tim. It's about uh, probably five to eight miles north of Floyd Wells. Moving on then to Mr. Browning's second application. Uh, 1,600 acres. Um, and those acres were just for the stuff that is in their allotment lease. Okay. So it'll be more, a lot more public land acres then? Uh, not a lot more because it's all checkerboard. Oh, so. yeah, I guess I didn't look at it. Sorry. So, so there'll be some, some public access to state land, um, a half section at least. Um, so he's proposing the access to one and a half sections or more that they have of public land, plus you'll have some additional access. There's like two and a half sections, looks like. And we may be able to get uh, game retrieval over to that. Uh, Sorry. Cell section of BLM below that state section or half section on the east side. I just, I mean, with it being checkerboard, a um, little better hunting opportunity if you don't just drive through there completely the whole way, so. Another point on this, because it's east of Highway 24, this is in a, in a general mule deer hunting area. Is that correct, Tim? Yep, this is in a general uh, area, so this probably will get a little more use than the other side for mule yep. deer hunting. That was the point to where I was was going to. I would I, I would assume this area probably gets more hunting use than the parcels on the west side of the road. Yeah, it will. It, it's I mean, as you if you can make it out there, this is really good uh, habitat. Uh, yep. The Macomb Breaks area is pretty awesome. Let's catch it. Uh, state section thirty two and twenty eight and a half to be on them. Yep. Yeah. And then so that it would get you into uh, the top section of uh, 28. But since they that's not part of their lease, I did not include that into the total acres. Okay. And then section 30 is legally accessible off the highway. So yep. I'm a yes on it. Me too. I'm a yes. 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 Yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Mr. Browning has a third application here. Uh, again, 1,200 acres, almost 1,300 acres of lease that they have. Same kind of deal. Um, more checkerboarded stuff, some intermixed numbered roads that the public doesn't have access to. Um, So, 
<clears throat> um, the, we met with the BOM in the Mile City office about, uh, they were concerned, they saw the applications and they were concerned about the parking areas on the BLM, which the parking areas wouldn't be on the BLM. Um, the parking areas are associated with the block management area. Um, the BLM had uh, big concerns about the more use of the BLM and then people parking on the BLM. Um, so those parking areas would be only if the block management area was in and then they would be on private property. Um, there is some concern from the BLM offices about the the potential for weeds and stuff like that. So um, just something for you guys to think about too. I'd move to approve this one or not move. I would just support it. I'm with you. I'd say go for it. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. All right. Um, now we're getting into uh, one. I had it wrong on your guys' uh, map. It's actually in Shoto County. I think I just copied and pasted McCone, but it's actually in Shoto County. No wonder I couldn't find it. <laughs> <laughs> My bad. My bad. After 45 applications, I found a screw up somewhere, right? Um, we had just, it's just over a thousand acres that they lease, but what it is, is it's providing access to a wildlife management area we don't have legal access to other than by water. Um, so I'll bring up the map. But basically, the landowner is allowing uh, the public to get to an existing wildlife management area, which is all the purple. Again, the only access that's legal to the public is coming off the high water mark, but this provides public access then into the into the rest of it um, if you don't come in by water. But yet, your uh, on this assessment form, it does say that research hasn't been completed about the pre-existing right to access. Uh, there's no. Uh, uh, no access needed because it's uh, deeded and uh, deeded land. So, and then it's FWP oh. land. What are the wildlife values? What what are what what does provide habitat for? Uh, there are some elk and bighorn sheep, uh, mule deer, uh, upland birds. Okay, thank what's you. The, what's the name of the management area here? We're talking about. Uh, it's a spring coulee, VMA, or WMA Ridge. Spring coulee? Yeah. It's south of Big Sandy. Eric, and I think this is one of those of what the intent of, of the Pella is all about. I agree, and I would support this one. It does access uh, another 320, a uh, little more state land to the south of this too. So um, I just looked at the W main portion of it. I agree, support. I support. Okay. And then there's one last one from region six. Um, we're at our 1230 mark. So I understand if folks need to leave, but hopefully you can stick with us here and we'll knock the rest of these out. Um, last one from region six is a um, good hunting opportunity. Uh, only once a one year agreement, but he, this is our first situation where the landowner wants improvements. So they're looking at a payment, but then as authorized by the this, this new program, landowners can negotiate improvements to facilitate public access. And so what the landowner is requesting is um, 
where we get into some of our, our design and construction cost lists and trying to come up with estimates and how much to approve versus, you know, what, what it could cost. Uh, the landowner, the landowners haven't submitted exact bids. They just have gone off some of the experience stuff and, and have some rough, um, rough ideas. Um, so in this case, the landowner is looking at um, a potential payment of 7,700 um, for 1,300 acres, but then also, like I said, wanted to see a 25 foot, 30 inch culvert, half mile of gravel, um, potentially a, a 16 foot panel gate, um, just off some real rough numbers from our design and construction list, you're probably around $10,000 for improvements. So um, this is a situation I guess we haven't haven't had to deal with yet, but this is one that comes up again later. So I guess a 16 foot wire gate is what the note says. So somewhere um, high value for the, the access as well as again, the landowners requesting improvements. And so how, how you look at those improvements is, is again, another area of your recommendation, I guess. Well, I'll throw this out. If, if we're gonna relook at our criteria between now and, and the next iteration of these, um, well, I, I just can't in good faith authorize spending up to $10,000 or really any money for a one-year agreement. I mean, what they're asking for, and and I know that some want longer term agreements, but boy, right now, um, I guess I I would be more in favor of saying, okay, we'll if if the group agrees, we'll pay you the seventy seven hundred or the one year for access, but until we get hammer or get the Relook at the criteria and, and come up with where we want to go with these or, or I'm just not comfortable saying we're going to spend a bunch of money for culverts and gravel to have one year of agreement and then possibly have the person back out. I, I think there's got to be a, a contract signed for a long term agreement or they they reimburse the department for those improvements. The region agrees with you too, Dale. Okay. And I would say the program agrees as well as public commenters on ARM. Um, they recognize that as well. They don't want to suspend that kind of money for a one year agreement. Um, there will be language in, a, in an agreement if it was to be uh, terminated prior to the end of that agreement. So proration, um, not only for the reimbursement of costs, but then you know to the length of the agreement. So um, I think, I think everybody's in consensus with your thoughts, Dale. Agreed. I agree. Uh, just a quick question. I think we've had a cap of 15,000. How does, and we're gonna deal with it later, how does the uh, project improvements is that supposed to be included in the 15,000 or how does that work? It's separate. So there's a, a payment, an annual payment of up to 15,000 per agreement. And then on top of that, the negotiation for improvements to facilitate public access. So they're separate. Thank you. Just a question, where is it they want to put that culvert? Because this isn't all going to be motorized in there, right? It's just to the border of it? Yes, it's only on the private property that the improvements would be uh, allowable. Um, BLM will will not allow the leasee to uh, do any improvements without prior approval on BLM or I'm guessing state too. So it's it's all the BLM and state. Um, 
more than I guess the acreage calculation because it doesn't encompass all their lease. Yeah, there's about another 100 or 400 to 500 acres there. That's not in their lease. So I've, I've heard in favor of the payment, but no improvements, unless they want to do a longer term agreement, which we can re renegotiate next year. Is that? Yes. Yes. Yep. 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 Okay. And I think that's it, right, Mr. Potter? Uh, I believe so for mine. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Tim. I'll still be here, but thank you. Mr. Mouche, thank you for being patient and waiting with us. Well, I'm still here. I appreciate that, Travis. Uh, I'm just making a note on the last one that PFPW recommends moving forward with payment, but no improvements at this time. <clears throat> okay. Um, rolling into, oh, uh, there's one more fun one I forgot about. Sorry, Tim. Mr. Hofer. So this one um, is- Sorry, Travis. Yeah, sorry, Travis. Sorry, Tim. Sorry, members. Um, this one became a little bit of a, let's say, conundrum for the department. Um, when we have written in rule that it must be no, no access point within two miles, um, we, we had started to write this one out, meaning it, it had an access point within that two mile boundary. Then through my conversation, with our legal department, they were saying we need to present this one to you for a recommendation because of the quote unquote gray nature of it, I guess. Um, they're thinking that that two miles doesn't really hold true in some cases. So the, the attorney that I worked with recommended that we bring this one before you to explain kind of what's going on. Um, currently, the, the public has got um, walk-in access if they come from any of the red directions, if that makes sense. So if you were to walk in on the purple line, walk north, then walk west, it's like 1.66 miles to get to the state piece. If you were to come off the county road and walk around kind of the, the ditches and, and a lot of things you got to walk around. It's about 1.8 miles. Um, this bottom line actually cuts back through the applicant's private land. So that I would just choose to ignore at this point. What the application is for motorized access from basically this point where my cursor is at the end of the one mile coming off the county road, driving around his little slough there or whatever, Cooley, I'm not sure. Um, coming around and then connecting you back up to the state piece here. So it's, it's that, that, you know, 1.14 miles of driving to get you to this point on the state, which is three quarter mile from where you could have walked in at. So originally, like I said, because it was under two miles, we had kind of written it off. Um, our legal unit recommended that I, bring it before you for a recommendation on how to deal with it because the applicant is, get, is, is looking at the BLM to the north of that state section. So they're saying, if you were to walk in down here, you'd still have three quarters of a mile plus some to get to that upper piece, upper section and a half of BLM. Um, again, this is kind of came in last, Last minute, almost uh, last Thursday, I had this discussion. I told Tim, we got some bad news. We got to revisit this one. So 
Uh, I bring it before you because it is a motorized access to the state. It does improve access to um, the state as well as the BLM, um, but it is within, depending on how you draw your red lines, is within the two mile distance set by arm. Another point that I'm look, looking at the application is there's no vehicular access and prior to November 1st. Correct. I did talk to the landowner Dale and he is willing to be open year round uh, vehicular access. Uh, when he was filling out the application, he didn't really understand the whole program. And once I okay. explained it to him, he is open for everything. So. So how does that get clarification? How does this score as far as opportunity and demand? Um, I don't think I even stuck that in here. Um, to see where I might have that file. I know the, the price was 6,500, I think, right, Tim? Yeah, and it was like right scored out to right at 30 and uh, it's not the best habitat uh, compared to those other ones so just one of the concerns that I had just with the rules that were established that talked about a, a two mile minimum and I, I certainly can see the value of having that north access route and getting towards the north end of that state land and then being able to walk into the into the BLM um, to the north those parcels that are outside of his allotment or appear to be outside of his allotment but if we start bending and saying well you know this one wasn't quite two miles but we're gonna or there's access into it that's not quite two miles then what point do we do we draw that line and, and the next person that comes in and they have something that's not quite within the boundaries of the rules, where, where do we draw that line? That's that's kind of my concern with, with some of that. I say no. I second no. I would say no also. No. Yeah, I'd say no because of the two miles. That's helpful, thank you. We'll take that note and that's why we'll not extend a, well, it's the director's decision, I guess. So. That recommendation is helpful to us because we had we had a couple of those also that were similarly um, that were denying on the two mile restriction. So being consistent, I think, helps us in this case for sure, especially in the first year. All right, I think that's it, Tim. Thank you. Thank you, guys. All right, uh, Travis. So we're into Region Seven now. Um, again. I apologize on the timing of our, our meeting running late. If folks need to leave, understand. We'll try and keep plugging through here. Um, so this one will be for, oh, send me some. Uh, Connor Beach is the landowner. Um, good habitat and access opportunity. High user landowner satisfaction. Um, is asking for a culvert. Um, so it'd be year round hunting seasons plus additional recreation motorized um, with a $2,000 culvert. And I don't recall Travis, if he wanted a multi-year agreement or was looking at one year. I, th I'm, I think he'd be willing to do a multi-year. Okay. For sure, just knowing them. Yep. Okay. Uh, I have Go a ahead. question. Under number seven, uh, one point was given 
but if I'm reading my sheet right, it's 949 acres. So that should actually be a three. Well, it's his lease, right? I think is. Yeah, I just factored in his lease. I didn't factor in the that section to the north. That's not his lease, but I mean, it would give access to that additional section as well. So there's the there's the map. Yeah, I apologize. It's maybe a little bit confusing. I was trying to calculate total acres opened through this program versus actual what these guys are looking at and probably scoring on the leases. So it'd be just 900 acres, I think. Um, motorized access to the to the boundary. Uh, again, it's probably requesting a culvert. Um, the landowner had done some blading and grading of this road a year or two ago, cost him about $12,000 uh, to do that. So he was estimating $2,000 for a culvert. Um, again, looking at our design and construction price list, that's pretty close. So um, if we did a multi-year agreement, here would be a place where you would you would have an improvement also factored in to facilitate public access. Travis, is this pretty good habitat country and animals? It is. That creek that runs through, it's really, really good. It'd be good bird hunting. There's white tail mule deer, antelope in that country as well. So it pretty much Eastern Montana wildlife opportunity on all of it. Yep. Probably a far enough away from the forest, no elk. No elk. I, I wouldn't no no elk in there. That part. This is south of Baker. And it's 36. Uh, good opportunity also. It's it's pretty it's probably not as good. Um, just because that it, the creek doesn't run through there. But as far as you know, bird hunting, antelope hunting, um, I'd say it's real comparable. My question is, would we be good to go with the uh, access payment of 6,500 and then review the two on the second year if that came up? I could go with that, but I'm gonna go back to my original question. If number seven is one, the 3,000 is correct. If number seven should be three, then the 4,000 would be correct. And that would jump you up to 7,500 and the two plus the 2,000. And, and I don't, you know, I just wanna make sure that we're scoring this correctly as we're moving across uh, when we're considering something. Why well, isn't it, isn't the rule, don't the rules say that we only apply the number of acres to the acres that that private landowner has leased that we're gaining access to. There's another, there's another scoring number that talks about adjacent BMA or block, block management. I think it's number three and it allows you to say, okay, well, we'll give them more points because it's, a, it's adjacent to another parcel of some type of public public land or BMA. And that is correct. But on our sheet, it shows 949. So we need yeah. to change that number then so that you can follow it across. Correct. My concern with this one is that you're looking basically at 320 acres and we're paying him $6,500 a year. We're paying him $20 an acre per year to access 320 acres. And again, there's some adjacent land there, but that seems uh, that's a pretty significant payment for 20 or for 320 acres.
any other thoughts on that one or revision or uh, I guess what would be the recommendation from the, the council? Uh, seeing no one else is going to speak up. I've never been bashful. Uh, I think it does meet our criteria. I do agree with Dale. It's an awful lot of money uh, per acre, but it's what the legislators approved and we're supposed to look at it, of course. And uh, again, this is one that I think our criteria really needs to be looked at in the future as, as several of the others were that we were looking at moving forward and some of them we did move forward. I, I, not agree. In favor, I would not be in favor of the uh, culvert, but the other one on a one year agreement, because it does meet the criteria with a comment that this is something that needs to be looked at moving forward. I agree with Rick. I, I agree with Rich too, and I think if, if there could be a chance to try and negotiate it down, but it does fit the criteria, so, uh, and no culvert. I agree too. Um, I don't see where there's access once you get onto the land though. It's access to the land, which is scored pretty high. But I agree with Rich. I agree. Okay, so I just put in uh, PFPW approves for one year, concerns over high dollar value due to acreage leased, no culvert. All right. Um, Jason, could I ask a question? Yes, sir. Where was that culvert going to be put in? Does that need to be put in so they can have motorized access? I'd have to defer to Travis. I think he has a culvert in there now and he he wants to he needs to replace it. Yeah, culvert replacement. But what if in that regard if it has to be replaced before you can access, what if we do that but take that out of the sixty five hundred or seventy five hundred, whatever it is? And he's getting paid for it, so till the same amount. I think we would have to stay at the 6,500, but explain if we can't get through, then the motorized access part comes off or the lease, uh, the whole agreement goes away. Yeah. So would, would, um, if the landowner wanted to do a multiple year agreement, are we still at a no on the culvert? I, I think where I came in before is it meets the criteria, but I think the criteria needs to be changed moving forward. So there's why I would be in opposition to the culvert and a long-term lease at this time until PLPW gets a chance or the legislators to look at the criteria moving forward. I agree, you offer it at the 6,500, that'll take care of whatever he needs to do, but it's contingent on the access coming to the point described in the map. Um, Country Cross Ranch. So they had multiple applications. Um, 
we consider it as, as one agreement potentially because of the same BLM allotment and then also the same access point. So when we talked earlier about multiple access points where Lander can shut it down, this is one access point, same, same spot. Um, scored out fairly high. About in line, I guess, with the other ones, does open up. Uh, two over two sections, I think. Is that correct? I guess maybe the section thirty-two is not is already accessible. Is that correct, Travis? Looks like it's from section twenty-nine through twenty-eight. Yeah. Yep. The access point would be section twenty-nine. Thirty-two is accessible. And then when you hit the private on 29 is where we'd start it. They did have these parcels available through their block management program or their map last year. Um, I would support. Is the hunting pretty good? Travis, did you hear that one? Yeah, sorry, I muted myself. Um, you know, it's very good. Their block management is payment is over. It's over fifteen thousand. They get, you know, a thousand hundred days out there a year. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Yeah, it's yes. a nice piece of property. Okay. All right, um, moving into Keystone Ranches. Large block of, of BLM. Um, the landowner is interested in a 10 year agreement. They're, they have a lease of 960 acres. Um, they're, they're wanting a, so whenever we do a, an improvement, it's actually a cost reimbursement so the landowner would be reimbursed. Um, they're working, they would like a, a bridge currently replaced. They say it's unsafe for vehicle travel. They'd like to see it replaced to the standard where they could haul semi loads of hay and, and whatnot and cows across. Um, the landowner estimate was 15,000 talking to our design and construction guys over in, in our other office, they're saying it's probably closer to 25,000. The landowner did do some preliminary work on getting some quotes and just to drive the pilings were gonna be 5,000. So we had talked to the landowner about, well, what if, what if the improvements were you know, half of your estimate and they seem to be comfortable with that. Um, based off the payment piece, it'd be 7,250 per year for payment. Uh, and then a 10 year agreement would authorize up to $7,500 for their bridge replacement. So year one's total project cost would be 14,750. And then after that, the bridge would be open for another nine, nine plus years. Um, so I go down to the map. Again, similarly, two applications, but one access point. Uh, good quality habitat and access. I'm going to do 10 years. Um, 7250 a, a payment per year. Um, but the, the bridge, so I started to try and draw in places similarly what Travis's map looked like, and then went to the motor vehicle 
tax roads to try and make sure that we were looking at, you know, eligible MDT, non-eligible MDP fuel tax roads. So anyway, the roundabout way of saying the, the applications for the, the 960, but opens up a whole lot more public land um, for that payment. And then again, a 10 year agreement to do a possible bridge replacement. Are they in block management? They are, yep. So 232419, those are all block management. Yes, they are. And that access, that road in there is the access road for block management as well. Um, the bridge is washed out there on section 35 on Pennell Creek. Um, so it's gonna, I mean, they have to fix it to get, so they can get across it. They currently can't get a vehicle up there right now. So it's gonna benefit them. It's gonna benefit this program and it's gonna benefit block management. I'm going to agree with this one, including the bridge replacement of the amount Period. The Almies who own this ranch have had a long, in my opinion, have had a long history of being very friendly to uh, public land recreation users or good managers. Uh, it's a it's a really nice wildlife ranch and uh, has a lot of opportunities on it. I, Travis, would you agree with that? Hundred percent, Dale. Yep, they are. They've been really good to work with um, for years, and they will continue to be too. So it's yeah. they're good people, and I worked with them for years in my career, and uh, well, I, they 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 just weren't better people in terms of allowing the public out there, and uh, and that their, their history supports a long-term um, positive attitude towards hunting and recreational use. I, I'm very much supportive of this one. Could somebody I, tell me the name of the landowner, please? Well, well it's, it's Keystone Ranch, but it's it's the Almy Ranch. Bill Almy was the primary owner, but it's I think it's probably in an LLC or a corporation now to where its daughter and son are the bill's getting up there. He's in his nineties now, and uh, but uh, and Travis, you can probably help me on that. It's it's probably includes his kids now. Yeah, and Kurt, Kurt, the son, Kurt Almy is pretty much um, the point man um, for the ranch operations. They have a ranch manager kind of doing the the ranch stuff, but Kurt, as far as the family goes, Kurt is pretty much the point on this one now. Thank you. Hey, Travis. I agree. Is this year-round access? Um, this one will be for all the hunting seasons, so it'll be the fall and then the spring turkey season, through spring turkey season. I mean, yeah. Thank you. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, the next one is um, Jared Kuntz. Um, this one kind of came to us a little bit of a, in a unique way in that there's a lot of uh, added river access value here. Um, oh, really good, Ann. Thank you. I'm kind of skeptical of this. So, um, so again, uh, the the value here is 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 to the inaccessible public land but there's also uh, value uh, to the to fishery and to the river access so um, there is access at the Terry Bridge just the high water mark access but this will allow um, users to launch off the gravel bar sounds like um, it's 40 miles between Bonfield and Fallon which is the nearest fishing access sites um, 
Dustin, since you're hanging out here for so long, is there anything you'd like to add on the fisheries component for this one? Yeah, Jason, thanks. Um, the uh, distance between the fishing access sites is, you know, roughly 40 miles and um, cut down a lot of river mileage traveled to, you know, kind of get around that, that area of the river, either in boats or um, it would provide an opportunity for river access um, close to, uh, you know, Highway 253 there. So uh, it has a lot of, a lot of good uh, points to this and you know there's the potential to look at improvements for uh, you know fishing um, and boat specifically boat um, access there so no I think there's there's a lot of merits to this one. I was a little confused where's the uh, boat access going to be is it in the green block here or is it over by the uh, 253? It's over by 253. So originally we were looking at this and wanted to make sure it would qualify for the program, which is why we highlighted the, the green area. Um, there's certainly value there coming off the county road and then just getting right into that BLM from the top side. Um, there's also, again, like we said, the access to the fisheries component. Um, of coming off of 253 there for hunting and for fishing. Um, if you zoom out, which is kind of what I tried to do here, um, that that launch point opens up a huge chunk of accessible public land uh, via river miles. So um, yeah, it just looks like an overall pretty good project. In my opinion, but I'd look to your recommendation. I think this is a really good one too. And there again, thinking about our criteria, maybe we need to put something in there on river miles instead of just acres when we talk access. I agree with Denley. That's something that should be considered as we move forward. With all the access under that BLM land from the, coming from the river, that's going to get an awful lot of use from the river access. I say yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Would this is Travis? Sorry. Um. Are we going with a one year? Would we go with a one year agreement on this? Because he'd probably be willing to do a multi year. I would be willing to look at a multi year. Okay. I, I agree with that. Yeah. This is uh, Dustin Ramoy again. So I just, with fishing, um, and when we start talking about improvements on properties, one thing that in the fishing access site program, PLFA program, everything that I deal with, we really look at um, making sure that if we're gonna put any kind of improvements in there that we try to have agreements um, equal to the life of the improvements that would be placed on site. That wouldn't be possible on this one because they're limited to max 10 year agreements, but you know, typically uh, boat, boat ramps you know, we factor in a lifespan of roughly 20 years. Latrines can be 10 to 15 years, things like that. So, um, you know, long-term agreement on this one would make sense, especially if we um, consider in the future doing any kind of improvements to um, make it easier to access the river itself. Thanks, Dustin. Um, moving on to uh, Ralph Hoosting, uh, it's a section of inaccessible uh, DNRC. Um, it's a good bird and deer habitat opportunity. Um, just kind of a overall, I think probably the vision or base vision for this program um, coming out about 2750. Again, just 
again, what I think is simple, um, but What are the dates? And I probably am missing it here. He's going to allow it open. Just the fall hunting season. Just the, okay. I would be, support, support the motorized. Thing. Okay. There's motorized access uh, to the boundary of the BLA or to the DNRC piece, which is what you're seeing again between that very first project we looked at. Um, that was a state section adjacent to, to, to BMA, where it's just walk into the state piece. This is motorized travel across private to DNRC, and that's why you see the valuation um, somewhat different. My question on it is just demand. What's the demand on that for hunting access or other access? What would be the demand for other access? Was that the question? Just hunting access. Hunter access or recreation access. I, I don't really see much other than hunting, to be honest, up there north of Baker. Even if it was open year round, I just I don't think it would be utilized. We have one recommend for move forward. Are there any seconds or discussion? I agree. I agree. Yeah, I'll go forward with it. Okay. Uh, Marcus and Ranch. Um, again, opening up. Um, some good habitat opportunity, hunting opportunity for antelope. Um, it does, uh, it's like two and a half miles of, of motorized travel across private land. Um, it's open for all hunting seasons year round. The scores on it came out to be right at 30. Looks like So what you're looking at is, is coming off of the Murkison Road, number four in section 11, driving through two, one, six, to get to a landlocked piece of a landlocked section of state land. I'm going to support with the comment that uh, unlocking public lands isn't going very far at $500 tax credit versus one of these. Yeah, to me, this is one that we need to look at our criteria it kind of falls in that area of the criteria. We're paying 10 bucks an acre for this and it's largely animal habitat. Um, I'm, I'm fairly familiar with this ranch and uh, um, basically it, it's an animal parcel that would be hunted on. Seems a lot of money to access to, for just animal hunting and, and not that there aren't other things out there, but I've, I've hunted it quite a bit and, uh, and you can hunt a lot of days and not run into a deer out there, sharp tails once in a while, but uh, Again, this is one that I think as we go through our criteria, it's something that uh, not specific to this allotment or to this section, but just in general, this is one that, that may fall under that umbrella that when we do a remus this next year. But I'm, I'm in favor of it. I'm in favor, but I agree totally with Dale. I do too. Yeah.
Okay. Um, so moving on to another fishing opportunity with river access on the Sackman Inc. property. Um, there's minimal hunting opportunity, but it, there is, it is at the mouth of the Powder River um, for paddlefish and sturgeon. Um, I think there's been problems with, with leaving gates open. And so um, the landowner has been allowing the, the free public access since 1988, uh, looking at a 10 year agreement, some minimal improvement costs for gate closures and signage um, and potentially a cattle guard in the future if people continue to leave the gates open. <clears throat> so it's not a lot of hunting opportunity until you zoom out, which is kind of what I did here on this map. Um, if you can get in at the river here, you've got all kinds of river access across the river to large chunks, again, coming from, from the other direction with the other, other water uh, when we looked at. Um, but the landowner has been allowing to cross the private through here and then also to, to get into the river there um, historically and now would be compensated for that access. Just a side note on this particular land, uh, mouth of the Powder River. I know the fellow on a committee that has the land that is the mouth of the Powder River and you can get there for nothing. Say that again, Ed. I know the guy that owns the land. You go under a river bridge and go down to the mouth of the Potter River at the land. Very good fishing. Uh, and I don't I think the John Doe public, you know, if you just talk to the guy, he lets you go in there for nothing. I know that's what he does with us if we want to go. Well, that's, that's who this one. is, Ed. Yeah, I was going to say, isn't this the same person? Yep. Well, Sackman Incorporated, that might be, yeah, but I know him by his name, other names, so okay, it probably is. I would support this one. Yes, I would too. Yes. The fellow. Yep. For a multi-year agreement, correct? Correct. Okay. All right, I think we've got one left. Uh, CA Weeding and Sons. Um, high quality wildlife habitat and access opportunity. Um, good opportunity into the breaks would reduce some elk conflict. We did try and squeeze in fishing, but we decided it wasn't real applicable because it's over 10 miles to get to any fishing opportunity on foot. Uh, comes out about 7,000. And it'd be for those two. He, so he owns or has the lease on those that BLM chunk, but then opens up a lot more country there in Garfield County. So um, is this in the permitted area then? It is for elk, mm -hmm. but not for deer. Thank you. It's not in the CMR though. Um, your map here is very busy. You look at a different one here now. Okay, that's Which one? the first one you just took off. Oh, so this this one is their block management area. And so what you're looking at is the same thing right here. So they use their block management map when they submitted their application. 
So you're coming off the road, getting to the BLM parcels that they have the lease on, which is which is the same thing as those um, green lines on the on this map. So my question is, when you look at that block management map, why did we only put in the? Uh, oh no, we do have twenty four thousand in there. Okay, it opens up twenty four thousand acres. Yeah, probably that and more. I, I kind of probably roughly drew a outline just depending on how far you really wanted to go with this one. But it's probably even more than that. Um, on, that uh, on that particular map, is that parking moving over to the X axis? No, the parking areas are gonna be where the parking areas are. And I, I was just showing where the access to the BL, how you would access BLM through the private from the parking area. Is that pretty tough terrain? Once you get back up into that BLM, it is, yeah. So in the practical use for elk, is that the primary opportunity is elk, I imagine? Well, they got, I mean, elk, mule deer, they got, there's turkeys back in there. Um, okay. There's antelope up in that country too. So getting back to the question of the parking areas, uh, you got to walk a mile and a half then to get to the public land. Is that correct? Well, it's walking, it's bicycle, it's horseback. That's what they stated on their application. A couple of things on on the application on number seven, um, you gave it a level five, but um, the reality of it is if we are looking only at the lands that weedings have leased that we're providing access to, we're looking at something less than a section of land. Is that correct? Isn't, isn't that the criteria that we're supposed to be applying to this? I mean, really, really, it's, I think, I guess that that's what the, that's only who can enroll in the program is the, the adjacent landowner. I think the fact that it opens up large tens of thousands of acres is something to factor in. That's what this is really looking at is Yes, it opens up a, a piece of leased land, but it's, it's what is the what is the public access gained as a whole? Okay, I, I thought number three talked about that to where you could give them more points of it accessed adjacent public lands, but number seven was specific to the number of of inaccessible or marginally accessible public lands that the landowner actually owned. Held the lease on. Right. Which would tell me number seven should probably be a score of two as opposed to five. I have one. Number Go three ahead. would be in, increased to five, though. I guess I, I was not understanding maybe the scoring criteria clear enough because I, I would see it as probably how Travis scored it, but um, that's again, because we spent too many hours staring at it probably. Well, it's a discussion we had at some of the earlier ones today. There was another one though where they had 960 or 980 and it's so, a well, right. actually they, they leased 320. So the criteria needs to be applied to the 320 just for consistently consistent yep. standpoint and I don't know I don't know that it would change our scoring on this well on the west creek west butte creek road you go north there and you hit the BLM again you actually have access to all that BLM it's continuous with this on if you wanted to walk that far 
And I and I it appears to me it would change the or potentially could change the criteria. Of course, a lot of them are subjective, but uh, if we uh, lowered it by two points or three points, um, it would take you down into the thirties. So their actual allotment is more than just what I have highlighted. I just kind of highlighted the access points on the BLM, but the, the lease is actually quite a bit more, if that makes sense. But would the agreement with the access that are that's taking you into, you know, on that one map, it shows, you know, two, two axes on the public land. And I guess, in, you know, when you look at that map, it does show that their land base is significantly more than, than, uh, than what's outlined on the one map. So yeah, yeah. looking at that, that, we probably do need to, that number seven needs to be revised, but it's, it's not a two, it's probably, it's probably uh, a three or a four. Is, is there other lease land contiguous to what's outlined? Jason, go down to the block management map. Yeah, so you, you can kind of see it there. So the BMA boundary there on the west side would be their allotment that they've got. Current, so, extend yeah, all. so if, if you change the, the map with the green line around it and, and extend and include the rest of those acres, uh, that would put your scoring maybe not at five, but at four. So yeah, if that one was to go to a four, and then three to go up to a five, you're basically a wash. Um, if you left it as a four and, and kept that one as a four, you're down one point, uh, which would be in that 4,000. So it'd change it by $1,000. So it'd be 6,000 instead of seven. Well, irregardless, I think it, at least the map, when when it, if it is approved to draw be drawn up, we should that map should include all of what they have the control over, so that it it shows it uh, justifies it a little more. I would agree with Denley. It shows that we are following our our criteria then. And with that, I would support it. I will too. I do. I support. Yes. Thanks, Carl. Yeah, yes. As long as you can get a bridge or a culvert over there into that next section. Okay. Well, this was our definitely our best first attempt. Um, I want to get back to Ed's comment. Don't you always carry an inflatable raft? Only seasonally. <laughs> Jason, I have a question. Yes, Tim. Um, on the Browning ones, uh, he was open to multi-year contract. Um, what does the group feel on how a length for those, if if any? Um, I had on, yeah, okay. So I must not have put that on the thing. So these were those uh, checkerboarded parcels in County. 
Um, you guys all fairly were supportive of it. The landowner is supportive of a multi-year agreement. Are you supportive of a multi-year agreement? My heartburn with too many multi-year agreements is that we've already discussed the fact that our criteria is in question. And so the last of those there for the moment, unless, you know, like the, uh, what was the one that was a no brainer? Um, because they cooperate so much, you know, um, that's my concern is that these dollar amounts likely will change on the very next go round of this for every other pallet participation. Um, so if we negotiate a 10, does it stick with that same amount that we're talking about right now? That'd be my concern. I, I think that's a fair question, Ed, because I, and not specific to, to Tom Browning's properties, but just in general, if we agree to multi-year contracts and then we go in and, and make changes, it seems to me if we sign an agreement that says, yep, we're, we're good for 10 years, it locks us into that, to the price that was negotiated for year one. And unless there's some workaround on that, I, I think we need to be careful there. I would agree. I agree too. So it sounds like no, Tim. Okay, thank you. All right, anybody else exhausted? <laughs> yeah. I'm the one getting, and I'm getting, I'm the one getting paid, right? <laughs> Um, yeah, again, it's been a huge lift as you guys have now realized we struggled through this, uh, mightily with all these situations and, and more, uh, even the ineligible ones we didn't touch, but, um, you know, I think there's, there's definitely concerns from, from within the department, as well as you all on, on how the scoring criteria we developed does or does not work. Um, I think we saw some projects where it works really good. We saw some projects where we need to figure out how we can standardize something else going forward. So that's going to be the big task. Um, the next, next meeting primarily is to work on what this looks like in, in year two. Um, we, we would have a, an appropriation for this year, this calendar year, this fiscal year started just july 1st so we'll have have dollars to do agreements into 2021 so we have to make it we have to make um, changes we know that um, what those changes look like either a result of the legislature or even like i said the the, the dollar figures um, the only guidance that we're given through statute is everything is negotiable so we're we're kind of flirting with that line a little bit when we start putting hard, hard numbers on things, but um, we, I think we did a, we did a pretty good job. Like I said, it's, there's always room for improvement with this one, but it's been a huge lift and a huge headache for a lot of people. And um, given the short timeline we had to work with didn't help much either. But. Any other you thoughts? Know, I, I, I would just like to say, you know, that even though the council asked some hard questions, I, I don't lose sight of the amount of work that Jason and, and the access coordinators in the different regions went through to have something put in front of us, especially with a short deadline. And uh, it's easy to pick it apart, but I also, like I say, recognize just the short time frame that people had to, to work on this. and. Uh, just the timeline that you had that we had to deal with this, I think we will come up with a better product as we go forward. But this really gave us the chance to work through these for a while. And, and as we get in and start looking at them, you know, whenever our next meetings are, um, now we have some real world examples to work on. But it, 
at least from me, I'd like to say thanks to all of you for all the time that you took and, and your willingness to answer questions and be a part of this. It, it certainly was, it, it was hugely valuable to me. I agree with Dale and I want to thank those people in the field because they're the ones that are out there beating the bush and sometimes you know, friendly people and sometimes not. So thanks for your efforts and uh, contacting everybody. And I just reemphasize that, uh, you know, as we go forward, clearly this has to be, um, I guess, finally accepted with the understanding that it's going to change. I mean, there's just no question it's going to change. So these these folks that are cooperating in it right now need to know that this is the first year. Expect it to change next year. We appreciate the participation and that all of us are learning a lot in the application of it. And we need, we're going to have to work out the inequities that we see as this comes through. I would really like to hear from, not now, <laughs> um, all of these regional uh, staff that have worked on this and commented and now worked through it with us in this aspect. I would like your main points that you see now that we need to clarify. It, it's real helpful for me to see your commentary um, based on the regions and your particular uh, relationships out there, I think they're pretty critical. The, the last thing I have is, uh, you know, what is our term? I mean, last year we were done and uh, this, I think we're in a pickle here because, you know, we've got an election coming up, we've got a legislative year coming up. Um, I think this thing is a great opportunity and also very, very muddy right now. And I expect we're going to hear a fair bit about it um, once it all kind of becomes out in the public, what's going on. There's going to be pluses and minuses. So I need to know where are we at in our terms. Um, and we're talking about a September or October meeting in the past. We've, you know, we've not had anything going on there. I'm willing to, to do whatever. Um, so I I think we need to address that with the governor, I guess, or the department on, on how these terms are going to finish out and, and how it will go forward into the next year. You know, you're going to get another one year, two year delay um, when all this has been begun. And then we haven't gone on to the other questions that we want to wrap up as a group too. So again, thank you to, to the regional staff and uh, the headquarters staff, I appreciate your your hard work and and ability to address the questions that always come up. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Ed. As far as the the timeline, at least, um, and maybe Ron can highlight a little bit. But um, you guys are at least appointed till August first of twenty twenty one. So. I don't know how the transition takes place or how that process works, but at least in my opinion, we've got documents that say here's the names and here's the people and here's the dates. So we can at least work with you through the fall, through the winter. Um, you know, this, this program is, is something we'd like to push earlier into the calendar year, particularly, you know, for block management purposes, this is the, the busiest time of year and to add this workload didn't help regional folks at all. So um, you know, we'd like to probably be having this review process even a month ago. Um, so that means everything. Forward. So I think you know, as we look through the fall, um, I've heard, I know the, the migration group wants to get together and, and have a panel discussion. Um, I think given the nature of this piece, PALA, it's gonna take probably a day at least to figure out what it is we need to change and how we change it. Um, which you know puts us at a day or two meeting, two day meeting for sure. Probably, I hope that doesn't come through this format, but you never know. Um, I heard a comment or proposal yesterday to try and do our next meeting uh, at the beginning or prior, just prior to uh, the antelope season. So, 
I'm not sure exactly what date that is, but if, do you have a, a detail that that would be? Look quick too. Does that work with folks if we try and target that time frame? The animal season starts on the 10th of October. Okay. I probably won't work for me, but that, so. <laughs> okay. I'm just gonna throw out, I'm not opposed to a, a Zoom meeting before then. August is better for me than October. I'll do my best in October, but you know, I'm not opposed to us getting together, even if we do it in four hour chunks, you know, we've got enough to do um, I think we've survived this pretty well, um, and it's very efficient. So I'm not opposed to doing something earlier. I'll do my best to be available in October. Yeah, I think um, I think that's wise. Maybe like that third week of August, perhaps. So once we get the block management stuff off the ground and running, um, like that August 17, 18 somewhere in there. Um, we can do one of these Zoom meetings again, primarily to hash out uh, what will be coming to you in draft language for uh, proposals for EQC. So recognizing that's a September 9 and 10 deadline, it gives us a chance to revisit discussion from yesterday and look at drafts and, and talk that over. Um, Ron, do you know when, I can reach out to Hope, I'll let you do it too, but what, what the deadline would be for agenda topics for EQC for the September meeting? It's usually about, a, oh, let's see, it was, she just sent out stuff for this EQC meeting the 29th and 30th today. Okay, so kind of two weeks before? About two weeks, I suppose, is right around that this evening. And they sent out the agenda last week, I think earlier, earlier this week or last week. Okay. You, you might let her know something might be coming too, just so she's aware. They're placeholders of some kind. Yeah, Ron, will you take care of that? Make <clears throat> sure touch base with her. Yeah, and we'll we'll draft some stuff, um, get it through our legal folks, get it past the director's office um, so we can have a discussion, you know, maybe that 17, 18 of August, is that does that look like it works on folks calendars? I think so. Not yep. going to be on antelope hunt somewhere. Okay. Let's start there. Um, we'll still look to probably an October meeting with the migration group, perhaps uh, maybe that dead week or something in there, but um, at least in the short term, we'll get this, this one, this one figured out and we'll, we'll maybe do it just a, another, you know, half hour or a half day, I mean, just focusing on that stuff, give you some more time to digest Pala and what it looks like. And um, then we'll be prepared for kind of a, Jan my, my plan is kind of on a January two launch for Pala applications. So it's a moved further up in the year, aligns with our tax credit application process. So that's kind of where I'm working back from, I guess, looking at a, a January call for public access land agreements for the 2021 year. Jason, I have a question that's kind of off different what we're working on right now, but <clears throat> basically deals with public access. Some person came to me and I, like I said, I don't know the exact routes to going all the, through the county records and all this stuff, but he, basically the comment was, they said back, back when the railroads were put in here and they got the every other section, they said in their contract with the United States, there's a statement in there that this land was supposed to be for public use. And that would be huge. Yeah, I'm not not familiar enough, I guess. Yeah, well, me neither, but I don't know if you guys have lawyers. Maybe somebody <laughs> somebody else might be. I know there's I know there's um, language that applies to it being reserved. From a, a wildlife management standpoint, the department can get there, but I don't know about recreation or the public. Yeah. 
I thought it was an interesting statement because we have so many BN sections around here. Right. Well, thank you guys for yep. your time and for hanging with us and going two hours over our a lot of time, but or at least an hour and a half over. I appreciate your willingness to look at all these agreements as well. That took a lot of work. Um, Ed, you've got a comment. Yeah. So on the uh, migration thing group, I would like to know from you guys how we would hand that off if we do a, um, a round table where that could go to take its traction in the future through the agency. And then after that, if you guys want to come on over, I think I'm going to have a shot of this. <laughs> right here. There you go. I'm, I'm uh, headed to the hay field, so I'll just have a shot of water. <laughs> thank, thank you all again for your time and for your dedication and your in-depth look at all these projects. We really appreciate it. And thank you guys for all your hard work. Thanks. Thank you. You guys thank have you. a good week. You do the same, sir. Thank you all. Yep. Okay. Goodbye.